Morning, glory, America. Bonjour, hi, Canada. Hugh Hewitt. February 22nd, 2021. So good to be with you. I am 65 years young today and looking for my vaccine shot. I get to go out with the huddled masses of America and go from CVS to the hospital to Disneyland. I guess they've got a big, uh, big place there. They've got a, a system in Southern California that's a magic box. You put your information into it and then they tell you where to show up, but then everyone tells me the yeah, magic box doesn't work. So I'll be spending the rest of the day looking for a vaccine. Good, good Monday to you. I hope you had a great weekend. Good news on the uh, virus front. Very, very, very good news on the virus front. Here in the United States, we have now got uh, 63 million vaccines administered. At least 43,628,000 people have got one. There's quite a lot of resistance and immunity that is conferred with one, if not immunity, at least the ability not to get that sick when it does hit you a second time. And in Great Britain, where they're ahead of us on the curve like Israel, they've announced a four month transition back to normalcy, the long awaited reopening roadmap. And they are going to open schools on March 8th, every school in every part of the country, in every grade. And all school sports will be back in a week. So I'd like to suggest to you if they can do it in Great Britain, can't we do it in the United States? In the New York Times, on the post-pandemic horizon, could that be a boom? Signs of economic life are picking up. Mounds of cash are waiting to be spent as the virus loosens its grip. Indeed, there's a very funny editorial in the Wall Street Journal today about the money supply and how it is enormous. The largest money supply since 1943. Uh, since February 2020, one year ago, the M2 supply has increased 26%, according to the journal. That's the largest one-year jump since 1943, and they show the, the Stay Puff man in green walking through New York. You ever watched Ghostbusters? Uh, the White House is backing away from its ridiculous stance on not opening schools because they're getting hammered. Other stories of interest, China's state broadcasters applied to France for the right to air in Europe after they got thrown off the air in Great Britain. The answer should be no, and the explanation should be genocide. Saturday Night Live is under fire for the first time in the Biden era for a quote joke. Michael Shea said this, cut number 10. Israel is reporting that they vaccinated half of their population. And I'm going to guess it's the Jewish half. <laughs> you see, that's not anti-Semitic at all, is it? That's completely anti-Semitic. And, you know, I, I just can't believe, I don't know who writes the jokes. Uh, the weekend news people usually write their own stuff, but we don't know for sure. But a whole bunch of producers and associate producers and management saw the script. None of them knew that's anti-Semitic. What is wrong at Saturday Night Live? Fred Hyatt, a colleague and titular boss at the Washington Post, has written a great opinion piece. If it will put this man in jail, China will stop at nothing. It talks about Martin Lee, who's persecuted by China, and he's right. Fred is right. China will stop at nothing. And then a famous black hole gets a massive update. This is something I've been studying a long time. Tijunus X1 is much weightier than expected. So I, just, I want you to think about that. Now, I've got a piece, my birthday piece, in the post this morning. It's in the print edition and online. Begins, WWTLD, what would Tad Lasso do? And some of you aren't going to agree with this, so you can call it 1-800-520-1234. What would Ted Lasso do with Neera Tendon's nomination to become director of the Office of Management and Budget? Apple TV's first big hit has attracted fans because of a rare in these times combination of Ernest Oshuck's dialogue and relentless good cheer. 
No spoilers here, but Lasso is Major League meets Bend It Like Beckham, and it's become an unexpected smash hit because it is anchored in, wait for it, forgiveness. Millions are clapping. They may not know why, but it is because forgiveness is inspiring. Almost everyone gets dealt mercy by Ted Lasso, deserved or not. Neera Tanton, head of the Liberal Center for American Progress, is a lawyer, activist, former senior Hillary Clinton aide, ubiquitous presence on cable television and Twitter. Because Tandon is smart, funny, and quick, she's capable of leaving a mark, I write. And I know I have more Tandon inflicted scars than all the villains in all the Zorro movies and television series combined. She has display, displayed the same cutting ruthlessness I write on Twitter as she has on cable TV sets, which is to be expected. She's a serious left liberal, though not as far to the left as Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, so she's left some mark on Team Sanders as well. She should also be confirmed as OMB director. All political people, especially senators, should live with the same rules of political debate as the rest of us. They should not get to use their confirmation powers to protect themselves from online criticism, however hurtful. Everyone draws the line at threats. But Tandon has just been clobbered, had been clobbering people the old-fashioned way with words. By 19th century standards, actually, she's pretty tame. More to the point, it's the 21st century online and television and radio barbs are part of freedom's fray. Which brings us back to Ted Lasso and the Constitution. Lasso's an old American football coach hired to lead a mediocre British soccer team, and he embodies a cross-section of old-school virtues and out-of-place witticisms in this postmodern world. The success of the show is an argument that more Lassoian temperament would serve us all well, including don't take yourself so seriously. Now, Tandon's decidedly non-toned-down past is put her nomination in peril. Senator Joe Manchin, who's a Democrat, announced Friday he would not support Tandon, citing her overtly partisan statements and consequent toxic and detrimental impact on her ability to work with Congress. Tandon has apologized for her tart language. Senators, not just Manchin, but also Republicans, should accept that and move forward. Confirm her. It would be one thing if she were being nominated for a lifetime appointment for the federal bench, then the higher standard applies, and judicial temperament is part of the equation there. But that test doesn't apply to executive branch officials. Presidents are entitled to great deference in how they assemble their cabinet. Now, Trump didn't get that, but we ought to get it back. New presidents who have four years to succeed deserve their team in place. Absent some disqualifying personal flaw, and I'm thinking of addiction here. There are exceptions to every rule, but mean tweets doesn't even come close. It's especially true of the Office of Management and Budget, which is almost an extension of the president's staff. Now, you might have a different rule for Secretary of State, Defense, and Justice, but OMB is basically on the right hand of the president and deals with them all day long. Now, if we disqualify everyone who's done mean tweets, the most effective of the pugilists on, online, it's going to rebound against both parties. The younger generation is full of Twitter addicts who approach debate like, like, like the locker room on Ted Lasso's AFC Richmond. So senators should remember there will be another GOP precedent, and they will want that president to get their nominees. The GOP, the GOP may get played here, but they ought to stand up and, and just say, okay, amnesty, Ali Ali and free. We're just gonna all grow up here and urge people to stop being bozos online, but we're gonna vote to confirm Nira. That's my opinion, what's your 1-800-520-1234. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. 
He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmer had said. He possesses one of the secrets of success, for instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. The Biden administration is rolling back religious liberty and doing all kinds of things that are very serious, very far reaching. Uh, tell us about what the Biden administration has done with regard to uh, athletes, transgender athletes. Well, on day one of the Biden administration, he issued an executive order telling all of the agencies that you need to start enshrining the gender identity into regulations and specifically called out sports and athletics. And we know firsthand what happens when policies like that pop up. Uh, in Connecticut, we've got four young uh, female athletes, very courageous, incredibly talented runners, and found themselves competing against two biological males. And these were guys that at one season had been competing on the males team where they were mid-level athletes, a few weeks later, switched to the female team and suddenly at the top of the podium time and time again. And so there was over 16 instances where girls lost out on championships or had records broken or lost instances where they were able to advance into competition, um, all because these two biological males came to dominate. And that was, again, just two guys in Connecticut. Now, imagine we start rolling this out across the country. All it takes is a handful of biological males to, to destroy women's sports as we know it, where girls end up being spectators in their own sport. Um, one of the girls describes how disheartening it is. You walk up to the starting line and you look over and you see a biological male next to you. You know the race is already lost. You know you don't have a chance. And that's exactly what the Biden administration's policy is. It's put into effect is going to cause for women and for all athletes across the country. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Uh, Donald Trump, of okay. course, is, is complaining about the election, claiming the election is stolen, uh, and he mm -hmm. is being accused of engaging in conspiracy theories. Is it what about ism, mm -hmm. Paul? I'm asking. I'm really asking. I'm not. I'm not fighting with you. I'm asking. Is it what about ism to bring right. up the fact that Hillary, for four years, has used the S word, stolen, and has for four years referred to Donald Trump as illegitimate? And people on CNN and MSNB, he haw the ones that are accusing Donald Trump of undermining our, the integrity of our elections by using the S word, stolen, uh, when they don't say that about Hillary. Am I engaging in whataboutism, or am I talking about hypocrisy? No, you, you are 100% correct. You're talking about you're using whataboutism, and you're using hypocrisy. Okay. But that's, that's not my point. Is, is it, is it, that's, that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Is it okay for Donald Trump to not accept the election, uh, even if he thought it was stolen? He went through proper channels. He can continue to fight for it. I agree with you. What I'm saying is, it's great for me because I'm an independent voter. Mm -hmm. So if I have a person that's a Republican tell me, well, what the Democrats do are hip hypocritical, I agree. Both sides are hypocritical. Fair, that's kind of my point. Right. Again, again, mm -hmm. fair, again, fair enough, Paul. Uh, my reaction is this. When Hillary claimed that the election was stolen, she had zero basis to say this. She feels that the election was stolen in part because... Oh, my gosh. My staff has turned on me. Instead of playing Happy Birthday, they're playing Neil Young's old man. Honest to goodness. What a bunch of turncoats. It's mutiny. Good morning, America. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Let me check the markets brought to you by Birch Gold. 
You can buy gold if you want to have an inflation hedge. Like I say, that money supply, 23%, yep, year over year in the Wall Street Journal. And gold this morning is at 1,795, up 1%. Now, I, uh, I didn't buy gold this year like I did last year. Did that last year. Got a letter over the last five days that I was too concentrated in Amazon, which is not surprising since I only own one stock. I own mutual funds and and because I'm not smart enough to buy stocks, but they said you need to, and I listen to compliance people. They say, look, we really think you're overweighted, which isn't surprised since they have one, one stock. So I'm always honest with you. I bought um, Bumble, which is an online dating app that went public last week. I bought DraftKings because of the millennials habit for wagering online. I bought uh, Palantir because I've met Peter Thiel and had dinner with him, and he's, he's like Elon Musk smart, and all the government is using it. So I assume the rest of the world will be using it before long. It's a data aggregation analysis software. So I now own four stocks, gold, mutual funds, and real estate. That's my diversification. Part of it is gold. And I bought gold from Birch Gold, which you can find at hughgold.com. Or you can text my name, Hugh, to 474747. I don't own it in my retirement funds. A lot of you do. I own it in the real thing in the safety deposit box. I just buy the, the ounces when I feel like it and add to it over the years. And it sits there and it goes up and down and I don't care. I'm never going to sell it. It's going to go to the, uh, the grandkids, right? They're going to open up and they're say, oh, Baba left us this. And... Mom and dad's going to get all the money, but they're going to get the gold. And it's just runaway money. It's against inflation, and you ought to have some. Text my name, Hugh, to 474747, or go online if you don't got cash and you want to roll over part of your 401, 10%, or your IRA. Go to uh, hughgold.com. They'll send you the information. Right now, the 10-year treasury is at 1.34%, which is a pretty significant bump over the weekend. Gold went up 1%. Overseas, England and Germany are down about a half percent. Don't know what's going to happen today. On Friday, the Dow was up 0.98 percent. The Nasdaq was up nine uh, points, uh, which is something. Not nine percent. Dow was up 0.98 points. Uh, Nasdaq was up nine points, and the S and P was down seven. So it was a very slow day on Friday. But we don't know what's going to happen today. I just know you need to be protected against everything. One eight hundred five two zero one two three four. Now, a lot of you people are saying, why in the world does Hugh Hewitt want the Republican senators to vote for Neera Tandon? She is a partisan lefty. And she is. And OMB is an important place. It's very close to the president. But she usually held Mick Mulvaney was confirmed for that. Probably the most conservative member of Donald Trump's cabinet. Mike Pompeo was very conservative. He did national security at the CIA and State Department. But the most conservative member of the cabinet, the only member of the Freedom Caucus who went into the Trump administration was Mick Mulvaney and he went to OMB. And Neera Tandon is from the Center for American Progress. He's very liberal. And I wrote the piece in the Washington Post. It's in the print edition today. And the reason I did that, very simple. I want the President of the United States, this one and in the future, to get their nominees confirmed. They have a right to their team. And the objection to Neera Tandon, and Joe Manchin came out on Friday and said this. I, I wrote a few of my buddies in the GOP caucus. I have a few senators with whom I'm on a friendly enough basis to send a note. And I said, hey, folks, you really ought to vote for Neera Tandon. Get together as a group, go out and declare amnesty. And maybe going forward, tell people, look, we let Rick Grinnell through, and he did mean tweets. And we're letting Neera Tandon through, and she did mean tweets. But we're saying, from now on, just tone it down on Twitter. No vulgarity, no... They didn't use vulgarity or profanity, either of them, by the way. They were just sharp-edged, sharp teeth, sharp elbows. And it's time for sharp people to agree that what's past is past. Let's get back to the normal. You get your people, unless they're drunks, addicts, or have uh, swindled people or beaten spouses. one 800 Five two zero one two three four connection to the Hugh Hewitt show. Give me a call.
Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. Why are they doing this? The left breeds chaos. These are people with profound boredom in their souls. Math, math as it is, music as it is, art as it is, literature as it is, history as it is, is boring, boring. We're going to innovate, right? Hope and change. Why is the left addicted to change? 99% of their changes stink. They're harmful to human beings. So why do they? Because it gives them excitement. These are people who are almost always devoid of religion, or it's of minimal significance in their lives, and they fill that terrible hole with adrenaline. Do you know, I, I consider, I must say, I do, I do indeed. So I consider the, the notion that I must repeat every day, the globe is getting warm to the extent of constituting an existential challenge to life. Not challenge, end, right? It's a, existential means end of existence. Texas, people are dying of frost, correct? Staggering cold records are being set in much of the South and the United States of America, but we still have to live by the destructive mantra of the existential threat of warming. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success. For instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. California Democrat Linda Sanchez, the sponsor of the bill, said the impetus for introducing the legislation was due to the former president's encouraging of racism and hatred. H.R. 484, it's called the No Glory for Hate Act. It would prohibit the use of federal funds for the commemoration of certain former presidents, namely those who have, featured, uh, who have faced impeachment proceedings from the House on two separate occasions. They're so goofy, they don't come out and say it's the Trump shouldn't be buried in Arlington bill. They say certain former presidents who have been impeached twice. The bill would also restrict the use of government funding to create or display any symbol, monument, or statue commemorating a twice impeached president. And it would bar the naming or redesignation of any federal building or land after presidents in question. Hmm, who would that be? Wonder who they're referring to. Wonder which president they mean. Illinois uh, representative, Illinois Republican representative Mary Miller wrote on Twitter yesterday, seems as though no matter where he is buried, he will be living forever in your minds. Nothing says unity like a bill targeting one person. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. 
Happening now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Just everyone is now taking a moment for good reason to remember a true American hero. And, you know, I really never spoke publicly a lot about this, but I had the opportunity to get to know Rush very well. And Rush was someone that supported Turning Point in a variety of different ways. He was someone that I had the opportunity to have many different meetings with and get advice and counsel from. He was always so kind and courteous, gracious and humble. I remember the first time I met Rush, he was uh, golfing at a certain uh, country club. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt. I've just been reading The Telegraph, and uh, Boris Johnson is having a press conference today at 7 p.m. after he addresses the Commons at 3.30 p.m. to alert them to schools reopening on March 8th. And it rolls out. It's all laid out, four steps. And they're starting with schools. And they believe cases will be down to uh, below 1,000 a day by April 7. Uh, they believe there's quite a lot of immunity building up. Uh, the share of people in England with antibodies has risen dramatically. It's up to one in five people now, which is itself slowing down the virus. New, new therapies. They've got to get kids back to school. And they are being honest, unlike a lot of our teachers' um, unions. The White House on Sunday reiterated that teachers do not need to be vaccinated against coronavirus before schools can reopen. A stance Biden officials say is in line with scientific guidelines. Yes, it is, but that's not the line they took earlier last week. White, White House officials had for weeks been giving conflicting answers about when teachers could go back to work. And so Tony Fauci went out yesterday and gave a bunch of answers. And let's play them. First of all, uh, he is he, he's not easy to nail down. He's on with Dana Bash. Cut number three. You know, I mean, obviously, if it's a very difficult situation to get an absolute definitive answer what the what the cdc has tried to do is look at the risks that you have and try if you follow the cdc guidelines to get the children back in school at least with hybrid and maybe even when you actually have a an increased spacing with them that you can get it in what's called a decreased capacity if you do the four or five things that the CDC recommends. The bottom line goal that I think people need to remember is that, and I've said this way before the CDC guidelines came out, that the default position is to do whatever you can, as best as you can, to get the children back to school with safety concerns for the children and for the teachers and the educational personnel. And that's what we're trying to do. That's what the president is talking about, about getting those K to 12 schools open uh, within the first hundred days. And that's what we want to do. Yeah. Now, look, just it would be so refreshing, Tony. Just say, open the schools. My friends out there, you all know what the best practices are. Open the schools. Open the schools. Open the schools. Instead, he goes on Fox News Sunday with Chris Wallace. And again, it, it, he's just trying to make sense out of that. The Biden administration's had so many positions on this. It's like the Joker uh, wearing suits. Cut number six. No, I, it, it, Chris, I mean, if you want to pass words, I was listening very carefully. What Vice President Harris said, it should be a priority. She did not say it's a sine qua non that unless you get vaccinated, you cannot come into the school and teach. So what we're saying, and let me state it clearly, because I, I believe strongly that it is completely compatible with both with what Dr. Walensky said and what the vice president said, is that clearly we want to make the vaccination of teachers 
a high priority. They are within the essential personnel in society, and we want that priority to be high. What I have said, and I'll say it again today, it should not be a sine qua non. In other words, you cannot go into the school unless you're vaccinated. We're not saying that. We're saying we're doing whatever we can to protect the safety of the children and the teachers, but it is not a requirement. It's a priority, but it's not a requirement for the teachers to get back into school. You know, it's just so much easier to say, open the schools. Uh, don't tell people what, it's a rule number one of communication. Don't tell people what you're not saying. That's just trying to hedge yourself against criticism that are coming anyway. Don't tell people what you aren't saying. Tell people what you're saying. Open the schools. One more shot of Dr. Fauci with Dana Bash, cut number uh, two on masks. Why do you think Americans might have to wear masks into 2022? You know, because it depends on the low, on the level of 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 of, uh, of dynamics of virus that's in the community, and that's really important because that gets back to something again that you said. If you see the level coming down really, really, very low, I want it to keep going down to a baseline that's so low that there's virtually no threat, or not no, it'll never be zero, but a minimal, minimal threat that you will be exposed to someone who is infected. So if you combine getting most of the people in the country vaccinated with getting the level of, of virus in the community very, very low, then I believe you're going to be able to say, you know, for the most part, we don't necessarily have to wear masks. But if we have a level of virus that is at that level that it was months and months ago, like 20,000 per day is a heck of a lot better than what it's been. But that's still very high level of virus in the mm. community. I want to see it go way down when it goes way down. Uh, my advice the to the, to, I, I love Tony Fauci. I'm one of the Tony Fauci admirers. I enjoyed it when he was on the show at the very beginning of this thing. My advice is swap out the whole team. Get a brand new set of doctors, start over and have someone walk out and say, our first bit of advice is uh, schools reopen. The damage being done to students is so great, so massive. And we've got a handle on this thing now. Wear some masks in school. Teachers minimize your risk. And if, by all means, if you're a teacher over the age of 60, don't go back. Maybe over the age of 50. Scramble around, bring some high, but get it open. These kids have got to go back to school. And not just K through 3, though that's obvious. K through 12. They, look at Great Britain, March 8th. They're doing it March 8th. Everybody, all the in free. And that is finally some good news. Jen Psaki, by the way, White House press secretary, they're trying to they're trying to get away from Andrew Cuomo as the scandal engulfs New York State. The guy who wrote the book on how to handle the uh, the virus actually has another book out on how to hide the hide, hide the mortuaries, keep the morgues hidden. Cut number one. Well, John, we work with Governor Cuomo just like we work with governors across the country. He's also chair of the NGA. So uh, he plays an important role uh, in ensuring that we're coordinating closely and getting assistance out to people of his state and to states across the country. And we'll continue to do that. And there, of course, will be a process. The investigations will leave that to others to determine the appropriate law enforcement authorities to determine uh, how that path is going to move uh, as we look forward. But we are going to continue to work with a range of governors, including, of course, Governor Cuomo, because we think the people of New York, the people of states across the country uh, need assistance, uh, not just to get through the pandemic, but to get through this difficult difficult economic time. And that's, that's where our focus remains. All right. But Jen, my question was, does President Biden still believe that Andrew Cuomo is the gold standard, represents the gold standard on leadership during this pandemic? Just a yes or no. Does well, he focus John, on the, the, gold the president... The, pre the president, uh, well, it doesn't always have to be a yes or no answer, John. I think the president is focused on his goal, his objectives as president of the United States. He's going to continue to work with Governor Cuomo, just like he'll continue to work with governors across the country. And uh, I'm not here to give new labels or names uh, from the president. I'm here to, to con communicate with you about what our focuses are and what his objectives are as president. So she, um, she actually didn't answer that question because no one can say he's the gold standard. He's facing indictment, actually. Randy Weingarten, who is more responsible for shuttered schools in the United States. She is the um, American Federation of Teachers president. 
was on with Chuck Todd yesterday, and this should give you a shudder. Cut number eight. Yes, there's a, I mean, it, there's no perfect solution, but frankly, I think that New York City has done a, pr- a pretty good job in terms of showing the way. Big school district, lots of issues in terms of, of um, uh, old buildings, and we learned a lot from what New York City did in September and October. And in fact, my members, I just did a survey of my membership, and 85% have said that they would be comfortable being in school if they had the kind of testing, Mm -hmm. layered mitigation, like, you know, and and vaccine prioritization. And that's what New York City is doing. So I I wanna actually lift up people like Washington, D.C. The mayor actually made sure that every um, teacher and school employee that wanted the vaccine got um, vaccinated Mm -hmm in the last few weeks. Same in terms of the Oregon governor, same in terms of the West Virginia governor, same in terms of the Ohio governor. And so the, the when I hear um, politicians, when I hear Governor Newsom saying, you're always gonna find a way out. Well, why is he not actually prioritizing the teachers in LA where, right. where they've been in purple, purple zone, not in red zone. So, so we're, I think the issue is if the NFL could figure out how to do this in terms of um, uh-huh. testing and the protocols, if schools are that important, let's do it. And my members want it. They just want to be safe. That, 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 by the way, is just nonsense, utter nonsense. Open the schools. Doesn't matter what any other state has done. Look at Chicago. Look at these kids who are, their morbidities are going off the roof. The suicide numbers are off the roof. It is, it is crazy for teacher union people to stand up there and try and say they are other than the complete and utter failure that they are. They have stood in the way of children getting back to school. It, you don't need the vaccine. It's nice to get the vaccine. I don't think it's a higher priority for teachers under 50 than people over 65. I don't think it's a higher priority at all. I think teachers don't want to go back to work and they they don't want to do it and they're using it for leverage and other things. And it's just to me the most amazing, uh, by the way, I love teachers and I I don't have to prove that to people. I've done that for years. It isn't the teachers, it's their unions. Uh, the, The absolute indifference of the unions to the health of children is pretty astonishing to me. Uh, And it's just not going to change. I am not going to change that. When we come back, I've got to play for you a Margaret Brennan face the nation thing that offended me yesterday. And then next hour, we'll go back to Neera Tandon on the hopes that some senators are driving to work today. And they're thinking about, we just can't keep playing this gotcha game on Twitter or no one is ever going to get confirmed again for anything. Um, Let me go get my relief factor.com. My plan, since I'm 65 today, I always wanted to run a marathon when I was 65. And I don't think I'm doing 26.2 anytime soon, but I'm doing a 72 hour marathon. Did eight and a half on Saturday, 10 yesterday. I'm gonna do eight today after my annual physical, which I always try and do on the 22nd or the Monday after. And uh, that's because of relieffactor.com. I'm not fast. I don't need to be fast anymore. No one else in the family has done a 31230. So uh, until they can, I don't have to get fast again. But I do take this every single day. I carry in curcumin with resveratrol and omega. And I'll tell you right now, no matter what level of fitness you are in, you can be in a better level of fitness tomorrow. You might be the most out of shape person in America. You can walk 100 steps today and then 110 the next day and then 120 and then you just go up 10% a day. You can eventually walk miles and miles and miles and miles. It's in our genes, people. We are born to run, as that famous book said, and we are born to move. Tim Cook of Apple said, immobility will be the new cancer by the end of this century. People will know movement is everything for the human body. And if you want to have uh, support for the temporary relief of minor aches and pains that come with that movement, go and get relieffactor.com. Selena Zito is next, America. Checking in with Yinzertown on my birthday. No presents are allowed. Go buy yourself Grant, though. Stay tuned. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Nobody voted for that. 
If they did, Biden would have campaigned on that. He virtually said nothing about this. But it wasn't a secret, Joe. It wasn't. Well, it wasn't a secret, but he didn't say anything, right? He didn't give people to vote against him. You know, it came up once in the third debate, and he got so hammered for it, he never mentioned it again. So they do not have a mandate to do something that not just 50, because we say, oh, well, 50% are over here with Trump and 50% are over there with those guys. This isn't a 50-50 thing. Most Americans don't, don't want their communities to be less safe. Yeah. They don't want some people to have an, more advantages and benefits than actual American citizens have. And they don't want more COVID. And they don't want more COVID, and they don't want to bear the unbelievable costs of housing everybody from Latin America. I don't know who said it, but a wise man said uh, you can have uh, open borders and no welfare system. You can have a welfare system and closed borders, but you can't have open borders and a welfare state. We're talking to Jim Carafano of the Heritage Foundation. Follow him now, JJ Carafano. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success, for instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on The Eric Metaxas Show. Madness. Most people know this is madness. When you see a young man who suddenly decides that not only does he want to identify as a woman, he wants to compete against women, you know, who have quadriceps half the size of his. He's going to be a better sprinter. He's going to be able to do all kinds of stuff because he says, now I'm a girl. Look, I, I don't think we're talking about wanting to persecute people. This is very complicated stuff. But my goodness, this is pretty basic stuff. Wasn't there just an MMA fighter or something that, that uh, a guy who identifies as a woman and he crushed the woman's skull. I mean, I'm not making this up. I couldn't even believe it when I read it. Do you know about this case? I did, yeah. And I believe the, the uh, fighter's last name is Fox. I don't remember the, the first name, but yeah, it was an MMA. Welcome back, America. Who knew there was a town named New Alexandria in Pennsylvania? Old Alexandria in the United States is in Virginia, and I guess real old Alexandria is in Egypt. But New Alexandria is in Pennsylvania, and my guest, Selena Zito, who is here with the Inzer Report, has been there. Good morning, Selena. Good Monday to you. Good Monday to you. It's snowing once again here in lovely western Pennsylvania, which it does every day. <laughs> well, where is New Alexandria? I know where Route 22 is, but I don't really know where New Alexandria is. So it's a halfway point between Pittsburgh and Johnstown. All right. Um, All right. And it's this tiny little town. It's actually on old Route 22. And when they bypassed it, they pretty much killed the town. Sort of sort of like the Bates Motel, only not scary. Um, okay. and, <laughs> it's not scary, except you got a pretty big gun store there. Bullseye Firearms Gun Vault. So this is a pretty traditional column. But it's always useful to know what does the gun store owner see? Tell us about it. Well, what's really interesting, here's the gun store that I focused on, but I went to over 2,000 gun stores. And, what I, you know, through all of 2020, we saw, it's, you know, people read the reports, the, the surge in, in gun sales, but also the surge in new gun owners. Well, that has not gone away. In fact, it picked up so much in one month. 
it broke all records that were all broken last year in terms of new gunner ownership and in the sale of guns. And what that has done, as we talked about last year, uh, has strained the um, supply of, of, of guns, but it's also continued to strain the supply of ammunition. But what's really interesting to me is the amount of women that continue to outpace men in purchasing guns and being new gun owners and being out in the range and learning how to shoot and taking lessons, um, uh, that, that has that. And um, African-Americans are the big surge right now in people that are, um, um, you know, becoming new gun owners. But also what I think is even more fascinating is how much they now recognize the importance of the Second Amendment, something that many of them that I interviewed had never really even considered and sort of laughed at in previous years. Now, the FBI, you quote, as having reported 4.3 million gun background checks in January alone. So that's 4.3 million purchases. And here's the micro, that's the macro fact. Your gun store, or gun store owner usually has 800 in stock. He's down to 300 weapons. And so that is quite a run on inventory. Yeah, it absolutely is. He, 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 and he, what's really interesting is that he said, uh, you know, I, I, he's, he's the grandson of, a, of uh, a pretty famous gun dealer around uh, western Pennsylvania, um, New York, Ohio, around this, around this area. And, you know, so they, he kept a good stock of used guns on hand. Um, people love to, you know, buy an old gun you know, uh, trade it in for a new one, uh, antique guns, that kind of thing. And he's just down that nobody's getting rid of a used gun. No one. And he says that uh, the manufacturer, the distributor calls up their, quote, special list, and they say, this is what we have for you today. It's take it or leave it. It's sort of like a car dealership when a hot model yeah. shows up. You say yes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. It's just like that. Luckily, uh, Nathan is one uh, it, it, because of his family's long relationship with gun manufacturers. Um, he's a, he's on those lists, uh, so he's actually pretty. Even considering the times, he's pretty well stocked. And, now, and I'll yeah. just close by saying this: so it's because right the new the new surge is because the Democrats won. The Senate, so they assume that there is a likelihood of gun control, although Joe Manchin is never going to vote for gun control. So they're never going to get 50, much less 60 votes out of the United States Senate for a new gun control measure. Nevertheless, people see all Democrats and they worry about administrative actions. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. And you even uh, talked to a lot of Democrats in there. They were, I think they were most concerned about uh, President Biden saying last week, last Sunday, uh, that uh, he was going to make gun control a priority. Um, for, for, um, he said business. he's going to make a lot of things a priority, right? <laughs> like getting the schools open. Uh, that's the number one priority that isn't happening. And uh, I think that I'm not going to worry about his number 10 priority, which is his number one priority, until after he gets the schools open. Uh, Selena Zito, thank you, my friend. All things Selena Zito are there. If you subscribe at Selena Zito, do you get all your columns? You do. They're free, they're fun, and they're not fat me. And they send it right to you. So if you love what Selena does, go over to selenazito.com. Come back next hour. It's our regular Monday show. We got a lot ahead today, a lot of good fun because Jake Sherman's along. Michael Walsh is coming in. Dan Balls is going to celebrate with me today, uh, my birthday. I think Dan's been working at this as long as I have. Josh Croshaw, we got a lot ahead, America. 1 800 520 1234. If you know where to get vaccines in Southern California, you can also. Uh, you can also send me an email, Hewitt, HughHewitt.com. I have no idea. I'll figure it out. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show are brought to you in part by Birch Gold Group.
Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Madness. Most people know this is madness. When you see a young man who suddenly decides that not only does he want to identify as a woman, he wants to compete against women, you know, who have quadriceps half the size of his. He's going to be a better sprinter. He's going to be able to do all kinds of stuff because he says, now I'm a girl. Look, I I don't think we're talking about wanting to persecute people. This is very complicated stuff. But my goodness, this is pretty basic stuff. Wasn't there just an MMA fighter or something that that, uh, a guy who identifies as a woman and he crushed the woman's skull? I mean, I'm not making this up. I couldn't even believe it when I read it. Do you know about this case? I did, yeah, and I believe the the uh, fighter's last name was Fox. I don't remember the the first name, but yeah, it was an MMA fight, and um, his opponent, I mean, just her, I think, uh, some broken bones and some things like that. And this shows it, it's not even just a matter of of fairness of making sure women get to the beat, but it's a matter of safety because you start taking this into sports like MMA, like soccer, like others where you've got some physical contact going on. And we've had girls reach out to us to say, I have genuine concerns that. If I go out into the field and I get you know, slammed into by a guy, is that going to be the end of my athletic career? And I think that shows there are so many reasons why we've had men's teams and women's teams. And we need to preserve those for equal opportunities, for safety, and just for making sure that our daughters and granddaughters don't find themselves sitting on the sidelines uh, when they ought to be out there winning the gold medal and using their God-given talents to their fullest. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Larry Elder Show. Now I want to talk about this high school football coach, Massachusetts. He's suing Dedham Public School District, fired for privately disagreeing with the school's social justice curriculum being taught to his children. Now, because they're doing online training, kids are at home, and this football coach is hearing what they're learning in world history. Kind of thought that they were going to learn something about, oh, I don't know, you know world history? Instead, one assignment asked 12 and 13-year-olds to identify risk factors and mitigation factors when walking down the street with a person of a different skin color. White students were told to be fearful when they saw a black student with, quote, aggressive body language or in the, quote, wrong neighborhood, close quote. And black students were told to be fearful of white people in general, especially the police. And he and his wife noticed that the seventh grade teacher had a cartoon character of herself with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on. So he contacted the superintendent, concerned about the curriculum that had been changed without notifying the parents that the coursework was not suitable for seventh grade students. The teacher was not teaching world history. So following the email, superintendent holds a meeting with the Flynn's, with the, uh, the, the couple complaining. And uh, next thing you know, he has been uh, fired from his job as a coach. And I sent a letter. Quote, we are writing today. Sorry to inform you that you will not be reappointed as head coach. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Dennis Prager Show. This is the response from Larry Helder to me. (laughs) Dennis, I feel about that office the way Walter Cronkite felt when asked if he'd like to be a senator. He said, I'd love to serve. I'd hate to run. I have neither the temperament, the stomach, the passion, nor the will to run. (laughs) And if elected, I would not have the desire to spend my last years on earth busting heads with those doofuses in Sacramento. Apart from that, dot, dot, dot. (laughs) So I sent it to the pastor, and he writes back, Thank you for the response, and I must say, I agree with him. (laughs) That's after urging him to run. (laughs) 
Shimon says, I'd have a big bully pulpit if I were governor of California. Uh, I, I would have a big bully pulpit if I were president or vice president of the United States. But otherwise, this, this national radio show is a much bigger a pulpit. With PragerU, this, columns, I have a huge, thank God, bully pulpit. Because all I want to do is influence people. I don't want to have any power over them. I am touched, though. Uh, it would be, I mean, the thought of me negotiating with teachers' unions... <laughs> When I, when I believe they are such destructive forces in America that they have, they have harmed children more than any other single thing in the United States outside of, ch- of direct child abuse. What am I going to say? Hey, it's great to see you guys. Great to meet with you. I can't do that, uh, to be honest. It isn't great to meet with them. I have contempt for teachers' unions. Utter, total contempt. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success. For instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. This is this Democrat New York Assemblyman. If you're not following this story, this was Ron Kim. He's a Democrat now. Remember, he's an Assemblyman in New York State detailing the threatening phone call he says he got from Governor Cuomo, all because Assemblyman Kim is asking for some accountability, some answers over these these deaths and the cover-up. Here's what Assemblyman Kim said on MSNBC yesterday. And Governor Cuomo called me the the next day at 8 p.m. while I was about to bathe my kids, I was with my wife, and for 10 minutes, uh, he berated me, uh, he yelled at me, uh, he told me that you know, my career will be over. He's been biting his tongue for months against me. And I had tonight, not tomorrow, tonight, to issue a new statement, essentially asking me to lie um, and asking me, like, I, I just, I heard and I saw a crime the other day. And he's asking me that I did not see that crime. And, and that was the line that he, you know, a, a line that he crossed that, that, that can't be undone. And, and that's why I had no choice uh, but to come out and, and speak up. You know, many people make a huge deal about bullying and triggering people and and uh, being offensive. Morning, glory, America, bonjour, hi, Canada, it's Hugh Hewitt. I am the ripe old age of 65, but I'm not retiring till after the 2028 election, so you're stuck with me. Join, and you're going to be stuck for much longer with Jake Sherman, whose new Punchbowl News is storming Washington, D.C. and growing by leaps and bounds. Good morning, Jake. How are you? Hi, Hugh. I'm okay. How are you? I'm terrific. Uh, Jake, I wrote a column for the Post that's in the paper today, and it appeared on Saturday, urging Republicans to vote for Neera Tandon, the president's nominee for OMB, even though I've got more Neera Tandon scars than all the villains in Zorro combined. <laughs> and, and and that's simply because, I, and I know Susan Collins has come out this morning and said she's not going to vote for him and that Joe Manchin isn't. And I've been in conversation with my pals in the Senate trying to persuade them 
this would be a good moment for amnesty. Uh, you know, Rick Grinnell got through. I just don't want people kept out of jobs because of their Twitter feeds. Any hope for her? No, zero hope, Hugh. There's zero hope because, um, and also like, you know this because you've been around this for a long time, but forget Twitter. I mean, these were very personal attacks that people made, that she made on people. And I'm not, I'm not taking a side here. I'm just telling you how these people think. And you know how they think because you're talking to them too. But the larger issue with Tandon is it's not only the right, Hugh, it's also the left. I mean, Bernie Sanders has no love lost for her. The left has no love lost for her. They think that she's a centrist and, and they don't like that. They think that, that the Center for American Progress took, took oodles of dollars in, um, in corporate funding, which they did. And that's and listen, and the White House says, listen, I, at the end of the day, I'll say this to you. They're going to get near a Tandon into this administration. It just might not be into a confirmed job. Well, now, this is what my hope would be. I know Joe Manchin came out and Susan Collins, they represent the center point of the Senate, right? The most moderate Republican, the most moderate Democrat. If they got together along with a conservative and a leftist and the four of them came out and said, OK, here's the deal. Ali Ali in free amnesty. People have got to knock this stuff off on Twitter. We're going to give amnesty to Nira because she's qual. I mean, everyone agrees she's really smart. We're going to give her yeah, the no pass. Question. That's the thing, Hugh. There's no question about her qualifications. That's the irony here, right? I mean, everybody agrees. Even if I mean, you you don't you don't you're not uh, ideologically aligned with her in any way, shape, or form. But she's a very smart person. Yes, and I have I've dueled with her and lost and dueled with her and won and mostly lost because she's that smart. That's that, and she's funny. But she's a Twitter user. So maybe it's a moment to say, we are not going to encourage people to go down this path in the future, but notice how close she came to going over the cliff and be warned now. Now, it's sort of like February 22nd, 2021 is the date where you people, now your tweets are not gonna be erased. We're not gonna accept that. Cause she, Susan Collins came out and noted that she had erased a thousand tweets the day before her hearing. Of course she did. Nobody, I mean, when you're, when you are a Twitter addict, Jake, how many have you got up there? I don't know how many I have. Luckily, I never <laughs> want to be confirmed <laughs> to anything. Uh, I've been many. confirmed once. I'm already the Honorable Hugh Hewitt. I, I just, uh, my aspiration is to become the Council General of Bermuda or the Lieutenant Governor of California. Neither job has much to do. That's my, those are my goals and neither <laughs> requires Senate confirmation. Uh, so you don't think there's any way that the upside here of amnesty would appeal to people? No, I just don't think, and I don't, I don't think that people think like that because I think that that lawmakers never want to take a something off the table, so to speak. And I would say, on the other hand, I mean, who is the like? Let's let's drop your scenario for one second for argument's sake. Who is the Republican who's going to vote for her if it's not Collins? Is it Mitt Romney? I don't think so. I mean, she's been. She's been pretty sharp on Romney. Maybe he crosses. I really don't think so. The incentive is just not there for a Republican to save Tandon at this point. I mean, I guess I could be wrong here, and I'm not reading the room right. But, I mean, I, I just don't think. Who's that, the most decent? Who's the, you know, I, I would say Susan Collins and Tom Cotton are both the most decent. They both said no. But who is like them? Who has a reputation for utter decency? Good. Murkowski, I guess. Murkowski could be somebody who. No, yeah, that's, that's I... liberal. That's liberal. I'm talking about <laughs> utterly decent, good person. I think Murkowski is a good person. I don't know. I, I well, I'm not that... saying no. I'm just saying the person. I would say Jim Lankford. I would yeah, say Jim Lankford is, is, is everybody's favorite guy. You might get Lankford willing to walk out there with John Thune. I think John Cornyn is a great guy. Uh, of course, Governor Romney, I, I, I've always admired. I mean, there are people, but they'd have to go get Joe Manchin. They can't cut Joe Manchin off, right? If you're the Republicans, you can't leave him out there on the limb. You'd really need the Senate. To... And I just think the statements that they've put out, Hugh, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but the state, the statement that Rob, that, that um, Manchin has put out leaves him literally no wiggle room. I mean, anyone can walk anything back, right? I mean, we've seen that a million times. But these statements are, are pretty are pretty firm in their tone and in their substance. So I just... I would yeah, it would take say, a gang of eight. It would take a group of senators to come together and say, okay... And, and this Hugh, we're not talking about a very... I mean, OMB is a very important role. There's literally no doubt about it. It's the I think the Office of Management and, of, and Budget is the largest office within the executive office of the president. 
And especially in this administration where we have a raging pandemic and, and or I guess now a, a pandemic that's slowing down a little bit. But, you know, money's going to need to be spent. Uh, Biden has made that clear that that's his priority. So it's going to be very important. But Tandon, in a lot of people's view, is just not the only person who could do the job. I mean, would Gene Sperling face any Republican resistance? I don't think so. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to blank on her name. I've known her for a million years. So I'm going to blank on her name right now. But uh, Nira's deputy, who's not confirmed, uh, Shalonda Young, I think is her name, who has been in House Appropriations staff director for many years, who has universal respect. I mean, would probably even get Mitch McConnell's vote because he's worked, his staff has worked with her for many, many, many years. Uh, she's somebody who's named, and we, when I was at Politico, we named her as somebody who could get the post. So those are the kinds of, like, Biden has options here. Yeah, and well, that, that's not the issue, though, Jake. I, so that you understand my point of view is not about Nira. It's about the standard changing to I mean tweets. You. Mean I tweets. I mean, I, I worked hard to get Rick Grinnell confirmed four years ago over mean tweets, and because I've always made the same argument consistently. Twitter, social media, we're going to have to evolve. I haven't, I've never done profanity or vulgarity, and I don't believe in sharp elbows very often. But look, everyone your age and younger, your generation is just sheep dipped in mean tweets. If it becomes the standard, my gosh, no one's going to get confirmed in the town in 10 years. Yeah, and, and I would say, you know, Grinnell is a great example. He has gone after probably everybody on both sides of the aisle. Um, and a lot of liberals are noting t today and last night that Mitt Romney voted for Rick Riddell. Uh, sorry, not Mitt Romney. Uh, Joe Manchin voted for Rick, Rick Riddell. And Joe Manchin is not voting for Neera Tandon for a relatively similar uh, 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 sin, so to speak. And I don't think, I mean, Grinnell has gone after me with the fury of N you know, ten hell, so to speak. So I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I, I'm. I think he's what he said about me is not nice. And I don't. I mean, it doesn't. I'm not happy about it. But it's not. I don't hold it against the guy. But uh, you know, Joe Manchin did vote for him, and uh, so it's just. You know, I think people see hypocrisy here. But you're right. The standard has to be changed. I've said stupid stuff on Twitter. I've removed posts shortly after I've tweeted them and been transparent about it when I've said things that I thought were out of line or inappropriate. Uh, now I have a little bit more leeway because I'm my own boss. But still, I mean, I, I, now I just think twice before I put anything on social media. Well, you know, some of my uh, people that I admire the most online have gone offline. John Podhorth, Chuck Todd, they've just given it up. But that, I, I'm going more towards Twitter amnesty and social media amnesty, not uh, provoked by Nira because it's so high profile. And I don't know her, by the way. I want to make clear she's not... She's a green room colleague. I've been on sets with her. She is not a friend. I have never had a cup of coffee with her. I don't know. I don't even know if she has kids. I don't know anything about her. She's just a. She does. A good... She does have kids and a husband, but that's, yeah. that's regardless of the point. I mean, she's yeah. just, you know, a, a lot of people have a lot of respect for her. But, you know, anyway, it's going to be a it'll be a um, it'll be interesting to see what Biden does here. Uh, and she could withdraw. He could withdraw her. But your point is well taken. I will say that. All right, last question for you in terms of uh, confirmations going forward. My rules don't apply to judges at all. I, you know, I think Article Three is lifetime appointment, but Article Two appointments they're for fixed terms, and the president usually gets his team. I think if you did research, this would be the first mean tweets major cabinet post that was turned down. People have been turned down like John Tower for alcohol. People have been turned down for scandal. But it's the first time a major appointment has been turned down at because she's been mean to me. Yeah, that's right. I think that's right. I mean, but at the end of the day, you know, this is something I often think about is that people in D.C. and you've been around this, this game for a long time. It's just worth John Boehner always used to say this to us. And he was and it's something that I've thought about later in life. It costs nothing to be nice. And John Boehner didn't always live up to those words. No, that, that's, a, that's a funny thing for John Boehner to say. I thought he would have said it's, it costs nothing to play golf. Uh, but, you know, that's everyone their own. See, I'm not nice. I'm a talk radio host, but I don't want to be confirmed any, except the Council General of Bermuda. That is my life ambition. Uh, Jake Sherman of Punchbowl News. Thank you, Jake. Coming right back. What do you think, America? 1-800-520-1234. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com.
Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success, for instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. California Democrat Linda Sanchez, the sponsor of the bill, said the impetus for introducing the legislation was due to the former president's encouraging of racism and hatred. H.R. 484, it's called the No Glory for Hate Act. It would prohibit the use of federal funds for the commemoration of certain former presidents, namely those who have, featured, uh, who have faced impeachment proceedings from the House on two separate occasions. They're so goofy, they don't come out and say it's the Trump shouldn't be buried in Arlington bill. They say certain former presidents who have been impeached twice. The bill would also restrict the use of government funding to create or display any symbol, monument, or statue commemorating a twice impeached president. And it would bar the naming or redesignation of any federal building or land after presidents in question. Hmm, who would that be? Wonder who they're referring to. Wonder which president they mean. Illinois uh, representative, Illinois Republican representative Mary Miller wrote on Twitter yesterday, seems as though no matter where he is buried, he will be living forever in your minds. Nothing says unity like a bill targeting one person. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Just everyone is now taking a moment for good reason to remember a true American hero. And, you know, I really never spoke publicly a lot about this, but I had the opportunity to get to know Rush very well. And Rush was someone that supported Turning Point in a variety of different ways. He was someone that I had the opportunity to have many different meetings with and get advice and counsel from. He was always so kind and courteous, gracious and humble. I remember the first time I met Rush, he was uh, golfing at a certain uh, country club in Palm Beach and was so incredibly magnanimous, wanted to meet me, uh, ask questions about Turning Point. I remember we had breakfast together. He only ate bacon for breakfast. And I always always remember that. He said that the grease made him smarter. So maybe that's a lesson for all of us. And the years that came, Rush then spoke at two of our events, uh, one of the events being our Turning Point USA Student Action Summit, uh, where we had the opportunity to have Rush and President Trump. I think this was the last public speaking event Rush ever did uh, in Palm Beach when Rush introduced uh, President Trump at our event. And it was unbelievable. And we'll be posting clips and from there. And what I can say about Rush is that he did so much for so many people and even things for me and for Turning Point that I can't even mention, but I can just say they were unbelievable.
Morning, Glory America, Hugh Hewitt. Birthday day on the Hugh Hewitt Show. I'm 65. Spend my breaks looking for a vaccine in Southern California. I don't think I'll, you know, I will be your living example of how difficult or easy it is to get a vaccine because I'm eligible. Michael in Houston, 1-800-520-1234. Hi, Michael. Well, happy Monday. Happy Monday to you, sir. And happy birthday, brother. Uh, thank you. Thank you. What, a, what, what an amazing accomplishment. Um, wait a couple of years on that Social Security, okay? Especially oh, I'm not. I, I'm one of those people that are smart about that. 70 for me. I'm working until okay. I'm 72. I signed a contract with Salem. I'm there going until go. two more presidential good man, elections. Good man. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I was listening to your discussion with the uh, special guest there about uh, Nira Tandon. And, you know, in this age of cancel culture, I don't want her rejected because of her mean tweets. Um, you know, I think I did all of three tweets in my whole lifetime, and all of them were mean tweets. Um, personally, I don't agree with her politics. Um, it says right here that she helped draft the Affordable Care Act, so I don't want her you in. Bet. But it's it's par for the course with Biden. He's pulling everybody back out of the Obama administration. He's, he's dusting off all those mummies, and it's creepy. Um, that would get you canceled right there. Calling them mummies right, and creepy. Yeah. But the deal is, this is America. We cannot let this cancel culture spread. I'd really appeal to the senators to think about this. We've just got to stop this. Yeah, no. I mean, don't don't reject her because of mean tweets. You know, if, if you got something to say about her politics or her past performance. I mean, she worked in the Hillary Clinton campaign a couple of times. No, no, it's just mean tweets. It's all mean tweets. That is the entire case against her. I mean, yeah. they're... It, it, it is my favorite senators are against her. All right. People like right. Cotton okay. and Collins there. You know, I, that one of those uh, Senator Collins is in the center and Tom Cotton's on the right. And, uh, you know, so she's got bipartisan opposition with Joe Manchin. I'm just saying they ought to rethink it because you know, there is a great, great, great line from Shakespeare. And I, I would encourage everyone to consider it. I, I, it came to mind when I was reading Sherman, this past weekend, I finished Sherman, and Sherman is, is a magnificent biography. But it, from the Merchant of Venice, the quality of mercy is not strained. It droppeth as the gentle rain. It is twice blessed. It blesses him that gives and him that takes. Tis mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throned monarch better than his crown. That just mercy all around on this one. No, oh, Michael's gone. 1-800-520-1234. I'm not sure I'm going to get through to anyone, uh, but maybe. I got to try. I don't think it's a good thing for the country that we do this. I really don't. Margaret Brennan. Uh, well, let me do a market update. I'll come back to Margaret Brennan. Face the Nation did a dirty yesterday. I want to correct them on it. Uh, but I do want to do a market update brought to you by Andrew and Todd.com. Andrew and Todd.com are where you go to get a market, where you go to get a mortgage. And you get a mortgage when you want to buy real estate, and interest rates have been so low for so long. They are still ridiculously low, but they have ticked up the 10 year treasury, not your mortgage that you'll get on your house, but 10 year money. If you buy a 10 year treasury, the United States government will pay you 1.34% for it. And that is not really a great return. But that's the interest rate on which all interest rates are based for houses and, and condos and townhouses and second homes and refinances and reverse mortgages if you're a senior over 70 and no money down mortgages if you're a veteran. Well, you want to take advantage of this window because as the Wall Street Journal pointed out today, the money supply is enormous. And it's, uh, it's the highest it's been since, year, the highest since 1943, year over year growth. It's enormous money bubble out there, and that's going to drive interest rates north. So you want to refinance now. And you do that by going to andrewandtodd.com. Andrew Del Rey, Todd Avakian are with Sierra Pacific Mortgage, longtime sponsors of this show, longtime friends of mine. I've known Andrew personally and well for 20 plus years. You can call them at 888 1172 888 1172 or go to andrewandtodd.com, answer a couple of questions. And come right back here, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Don't forget to sign up for the Universe. All of Hugh's broadcasts on demand, the After Show, which in my opinion is worth the price all by itself, Dwayne FM, and all sorts of bonus content. www.huniverse.com.
This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success, for instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on The Mike Gallagher Show. This is this Democrat New York Assemblyman. If you're not following this story, this was Ron Kim. He's a Democrat now. Remember, he's an Assemblyman in New York State detailing the threatening phone call he says he got from Governor Cuomo, all because Assemblyman Kim is asking for some accountability, some answers over these, these deaths and the cover-up. Here's what Assemblyman Kim said on MSNBC yesterday. And Governor Cuomo called me the, late, the next day at 8 p.m. while I was about to bathe my kids, I was with my wife, and for 10 minutes, uh, he berated me, uh, he yelled at me, uh, he told me that you know, my career will be over. He's been biting his tongue for months against me. And I had tonight, not tomorrow, tonight, to issue a new statement, essentially asking me to lie um, and asking me, like, I, I just, I heard and I saw a crime the other day. And he's asking me that I did not see that crime. And, and that was the line that he, you know, a, a line that he crossed that, that, that can't be undone. And, and that's why I had no choice uh, but to come out and, and speak up. You know, many people make a huge deal about bullying and triggering people and and uh, being offensive. Listen to the way this assemblyman explains what Cuomo's threatening phone call did to his wife. I mean, it was loud enough for my wife to hear, and I tried to shield her, but she was in shock. I mean, she didn't get any sleep that night, um, and we were terrified. And, you know, she left... Uh, he left a, a shocking moment um, for all of us in our family. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Burke. We talk national security and foreign policy. And my, oh my, we've got a lot to talk about this week, don't we, Jim? Oh, man. That's why I said the danger zone. This is not a safe place if you want to be around me because it was. <laughs> you, you said you might get a little bit emotional. It's, I, you know, it's like, what's your nightmare? It's, you know, it's like the Freddy Krueger movie. Like you're in a nightmare and you wake up and you're looking at Freddy Krueger. It's the nightmare within the nightmare. Right, let's, talk, let's talk at the, the, the five meter target first. We'll talk about Iran uh, later. You, you've you unleashed, I'll call them the, the I'll call them the, the three horsemen of the anti apocalypse. <laughs> not the apocalypse, the anti apocalypse you've got the best of uh, dhs including mark morgan at uh, heritage now as your fellows uh we had chad wolf is the top of your twitter feed jj carafano his recent fox hit so give us the the institutional response your take as well the heritage foundation the ice guidance the immigration bill bad well, right so we have to kind of break this into two parts okay so first we're looking at the stuff that the president can do by executive order mm. which is if you were in for impeachable offenses for high crimes and misdemeanors you would think not enforcing the laws of the land would be something that people might be concerned about literally the president has deactivated ice this is the immigrations and customs enforcement the guys who are responsible for detaining and deporting people who are in the country illegally. Right. He's basically told them... They're, they're still there, but they can't but they do their can't job. Really do, they have to actually have permission to arrest someone. If you... Let's let's do a thing. Seb Gorka, we're, I'm going to take him down to Dulles Airport and have him walk through the, the airport and try to get on a plane without a mask. 
I will bet you that the odds of him getting arrested are way higher than if you are an illegal in this country, country who is a criminal alien with a felony warrant out for your arrest. The odds are that Seb Gorka will get a ticket and get arrested faster. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Maybe the best bump music for my next guest. I hold in my hand, if you are watching on YouTube or on my Facebook feed, Last Stands, Why Men Fight When All Is Lost. Last Stands is by Michael Walsh, who's been a guest on the show often, and he's a longtime critic, uh, music critic for Time Magazine, foreign correspondent, written a lot of great books, but Victor Davis Hanson blurbs the front. Now, VDH, of course, if you can get a blurb from anyone, and Victor Hansen says this, a philosophical and spiritual defense of physical courage and of masculinity and self-sacrifice in an age when those ancient virtues are too often caricatured and dismissed. Michael Walsh, welcome. It's good to have you, my friend. Oh, thanks, Hugh. Good morning to you and the whole wide American world here. Well, I want to I wanna really have you tell us a little bit about the genesis of this. Because um, I know one hero for sure. Bill Barber, like your father, is a veteran. He's gone now, but he was a veteran of the Chosen Reservoir. And he took me once to meet the Frozen Chosen to give a talk to the Frozen Chosen. And I said, what am I going to tell these men about? How am I going to talk to the Frozen Chosen? And it turns out your dad was in the fame 2-5. He was in the 2-7, I believe, uh, Bill. But tell people about growing up with a dad who's a hero. Well, the thing is, you don't know it uh, if they're doing it right. And of course, uh, I was born just before he shipped out to Korea. He landed. The war started in June of 1950. Uh, he landed uh, at the Pusan perimeter. Uh, as I recount in the introduction to Last Stands, he jumped in a shell crater there at the perimeter as a 24-year-old first lieutenant, brand new first lieutenant, and found some soldiers, Marines, hiding in the, taking shelter rather, in the in the shell hole. He said, who's in charge here? And they said, you are, sir. And as I point out in the book, he's now about to turn 95 and he's never not been in charge. That said, he never really spoke about Korea. Uh, I knew he'd fought there. Uh, obviously my brother and I were raised in the Marine Corps tradition. Uh, and that includes lots of practical survival training and weapons handling and all sorts of things that your average five-year-old uh, doesn't generally uh, have to encounter. But it was it was just part of what he felt had kept him alive uh, during those uh, very, very tough few months there uh, at the reservoir and uh, on the Marines' way back to the sea. And uh, it stood him in good stead and he figured he would it would stand his sons in good stead too. So here I am 71 years later, so it must have worked. Well, I, I was telling the fetching Mrs. Hewitt last night, uh, my father was an army man and sailed around the Pacific on boats and never heard a shot fired in anger. But his brothers flew over the hump and, and over Europe 40 times. And physical courage was simply a given in the greatest yes. generation. You know, you just, it was a given. My father-in-law fought in Guadalcanal, on Guam, on Iwo Jima, and never discussed it. So the question is, courage is like all virtues necessary, but it's the first virtue because it's the virtue on which all others depend. Do you think we have a leakage of courage in the country? Well, I think it's just, it's this, this book is really, a, I, I like to say, only half jokingly, in praise of toxic masculinity. I think we have a masculinity crisis. I don't think these young boys today, because of the way our society is now structured, uh, know whether they have courage in them or not. What you'll find, uh, as you know, Hugh, and I I spent a uh, couple of days interviewing my dad for this book, 
two or three years ago. Uh, they don't think about it. They, it, it. It was not something that occurred to them. As he put it, after the Chinese attacked there in late November of 1950, by surprise in the middle of the night, he said, you just follow your training and you go to work. He said, we went to work. And by work, he meant he was in command of, uh, of a mortar company uh, attached to various rifle companies. And so he set up and began that deadly work that triangulated mortars can do on a masked enemy and and basically that's all he had time to think about uh i once asked him were you scared and he looked at me like i was crazy but then again he's a marine so there you are well i, I began by learning something brand new i always love a book that begins with something that teaches me something immediately i didn't know about the battle of seoul i knew about pusan i knew about Incheon. i knew about the throwback i knew about chosen i did not know about the battle of seoul and that it was among the most brutal battles. It's Guadalcanal level of intensity. It's, it's Okinawa level of intensity. And I had no, Fallujah, I had no idea. Yeah, it was an urban battle. He doesn't talk about it. He, I, I couldn't draw him out on that. I, I know the Marines, you know, Seoul was recaptured and lost and recaptured. There was, it was a back and forth urban warfare. You could not trust anybody. There were no non-combatants in that particular battle. This is all that I've gleaned from him talking about it. Uh, it was much easier for him to talk about, say, the Incheon landing, which, uh, uh, as you uh, and I have discussed off, off air, uh, he was in the, the the LST right next to Valdemiro Lopez, who was his best friend. Uh, I, I think they were both part American. I, I know my father's a considerable amount of American Indian. And, uh, Lopez uh, might have been as well. The, the, the Marines attract uh, several different ethnic groups. One is the Irish, of which you and I obviously are. Uh, two is American Indians. And three is Southwestern Hispanics. And uh, they are a very tight group. Anyway, Baldy got killed that very next morning when he ate his own grenade after being shot coming up over the edge. Uh, he could talk about that. He could talk about the reservoir that was outside in 20, 30 below zero. Uh, Seoul, he doesn't talk about. It. And I suspect most Marines who were there don't talk about it either. Now, in the Last Stands book, which I'm holding right here for people who are watching on Skype, I got to make sure it's on the camera. Last Stand, it includes Shiloh. Now, the family, Fetching Mrs. Hewitt's family has a connection with Shiloh because her great great grandfather almost botched the battle by failing to deliver to Lou Wallace a message from Grant. And so, General Neffler is not really a hero of the Civil War. But I just finished Ron Chernow's book. And if anybody ever embodied physical courage, and I mean, there are lots of people have Douglas MacArthur wrongly called Dugout Doug Patton, but I mean, Grant and Stonewall Jackson together, Grant was simply indomitable. So writing up the Battle of Shiloh for Last Stands must have taken you into Chernow's biography and to that amazing Shiloh literature. Oh, absolutely. I read Grant's book, obviously. That's one of the cornerstones of military literature, right up there with Caesar's commentaries. Uh, I read Chernow's book. I read Ron White's book. Uh, I read a whole bunch of, of books to, to get to this. What interested me as a cultural rather than a military historian was how many people were at that battle who later became very, very famous, among them uh, Stanley of Stanley and Livingston fame, fighting on the Confederate side. I didn't know uh, that. Oh, yes, he was right there in the middle of it. Uh, he, he wrote about it quite quite eloquently. Also, there was Ambrose Bierce, the famous uh, dyspe dyspeptic uh, Ambrose Bierce, who later worked for the San Francisco Examiner, which I did uh, myself uh, years ago, and then disappeared into Mexico and was never seen again. Uh, there was a great number of literary people involved in that battle. So we have some striking images of it that come from non-military sources. But Grant was amazing. I think this, there's no argument to me that Grant was the greatest American who ever lived. And, and, I, and I may even put him over Lincoln in just the sheer willpower that won the Civil War, which was embodied in Grant. And the realize I call Shiloh a last stance, which is somewhat controversial, is had Grant lost on the first day of Shiloh, Grant and Sherman, by the way, who was there and who discounted the reports of a large Confederate force coming towards them that morning, uh, uh, April morning, uh, that would have been the end of it for the Union. Grant, you never would have heard of Grant again. He was already excoriated after they won for the bloodshed, which was, which was, incomparable in American history up to that point. Uh, Sherman would have gone back to the nut house. Grant would have 
been considered a drunk who'd got washed out for the second time. And that, that would have been the end of it. And had the Confederate general, Al Albert Sidney Johnston, lived, I think you had a very, very different outcome to that war. And it was, as, as uh, Wellington said of, of Waterloo, it was a, a damned close run thing. I, uh, my favorite line out of, of uh, Grant by Chernow is Sherman saying, he stood by, about Grant. He stood by yeah. me when I was crazy. I stood by him when he was drunk. So That's friendship, right. courage is actually reciprocal. But let's talk about the last stand, the book, the, the battles that you chose. Thermopylae. I had Stephen Pressfield on last week about his new book. Mm -hmm. He's written the 300, uh, the, the Gates of Fire about the 300. Uh, Cani, which is really a massacre. I'm going to look forward to this. Masada, I know about. Warsaw. It's interesting that you pair the great two Jewish stands and massacres. Um, I don't know much about Roland. I know about the Battle of Hastings. The last stand of the Swiss Guard, I have no idea what you're talking about, Michael. We'll come back to that. I can't even pronounce the siege of whatever that is. How do you That's say that? Sigetvar, Sigetvar. How do you expect the radio host to say that, Michael? S oh, well, say I it again, Sigetvar? Sigetvar, yes. It's, uh, you got to brush up on your Hungarian, Hugh. That's the key. The, the Alamo, I know, because John Wayne in 1963, when I'm a lad, come, I always say 1956 is the best year to have been born because you can watch Batman with unabashed non-citizism and you can go to the Alamo and be thrilled, right? The Alamo yeah, is yeah. John... Shiloh, Bighorn, not sure about Custer after reading Chernow. Was that courage or was that just stupidity, Michael? Uh, Custer was one of the greatest Americans who ever lived. Uh, I, this is the longest chapter in the book, 10,000 words. I am something of a Custer buff. I have very close to me here in my library a bunch of books about Custer. I, I think Custer is so interesting and his ending was so spectacularly dramatic. Uh, and it came at the time of the American centennial. Uh, very few people know that Custer's plan was to win that battle, go back to New York and win the Democrat nomination for president. So in one sense, the, the Bighorn was the world's worst campaign event. But what a fascinating man. Talk about stone courage. And by the way, he and Grant did not get along. Not at, at all. all at, at all, at all. They hated each other's guts. And the guy that saved Custer was little Phil Sheridan, the little Irish immigrant boy who did, wasn't much when he was standing up, but he looked great on a horse and, and was the master of the cavalry, which won the Shenandoah campaign and, and led to uh, Appomattox. Let me also tell people, Rourke's Drift and Khartoum, great movies. By the way, your last stands all make great movies. The yes, Battle do. of the Stalingrad, which is a Sniper at the Gate. That movie is really an amazing. And then you close with The Chosen Reservoir. So I, we're going to come back and talk about these over the next few months. But I want to, for the purposes of introducing people to The Last Stand, I'm going to blow through the break, Adam, so you know that. And I will come back so that we can make this a longer um, entry into the interview uh, for my podcast, the interview. When you sat down to do this, Authors have a purpose. What was yours? Uh, you uh, write about what's, what interests you. Uh, uh, this book came after Devil's Pleasure Palace and Fiery Angel, which are cultural histories about the, the war we are fighting against uh, uh, communism, socialism, and, and the just general malignant left. And uh, coming out of that, I realized that with this, this father that I had, uh, I could combine cultural history with military history and try to write a narrative about what it means to be a man. In fact, the first chapter of the book is called To Die For, and it's the philosophical underpinning of the book. Uh, what is it that we would die for? If there's nothing worth living for, is there anything worth dying for? And conversely, if there's nothing worth dying for, what's the point of life? Uh, these are hard questions for pampered Americans of the early 21st century. So I spent a good deal of time on that. And uh, Hugh, you'll enjoy this. I actually read most of that chapter at Hillsdale College just before the lockdown started uh, to a very appreciative audience of, of students there. So uh, thanks to Larry Arn and the uh, crew at Hillsdale for giving me a chance to take that on a test drive early in the process. So uh, what is courage? Uh, I think it's something you don't think about. I think it's something that every man is 
uh, on a level when you were a little boy and you were getting killed in battles with you know the evil Nazis and the and the Jeb. Well, in our generation, it was the Japanese and the Nazis. I, I don't know who little boys fight today, but you wonder how would you die if you had to? And I make a statement in the book that says, you know, the old. Uh, uh, cowards die a thousand deaths, heroes die but one. I said little boys die a thousand deaths, so they only have to die one time in actual fight. I think you don't think about it. Everyone's afraid until the last minute. But when you go back through history, not just the Greeks, which was rather spectacular self-immolation, but the poor Romans at Cannae, knowing they were doomed, just inexorably doomed by Hannibal's outmaneuvering of their two idiotic consul generals, both of whom were killed in that fight, uh, they fought to the end, and Tacitus tells us at one point they found a Roman soldier face down in the mud with the ear and the nose of one of his Numidian opponents in his teeth. They just fought to the end because that's really all you can do. I just think it's an unconscious, innately masculine thing that uh, uh, that history shows us time and again is how men react to this kind of stress. One of the early glimpses of Stone Cold Courage that you give in Last Stands, Michael Walsh, is of the two Roman legions under Octavius and Mark Antony uh, squaring off against each other. And I did not know this, absolutely silent. Now I know my Roman yeah. history pretty well, but I did not know that detail. Absolutely silent, no rebel, rebel yells, no union cheers, no founding of the, at the opening of Gladiator, if people have seen it, the noise, unleash hell, just, Two professional sets of warriors gone off to battle. Yes, it's a, the Battle of Mutina, and it, it pitted Antony against uh, Octavian uh, before they became allies in the final act of the Civil War, and then, of course, they became enemies again. Uh, but that comes from contemporary Roman historians. Uh, the Romans wore those high plumes, and they they tried. To, they weren't very big. Uh, they were always at a physical disadvantage against, say, the Germans, who were much bigger than they were, and they were afraid of the Germans. Their own discipline kept them victorious, mostly against the Germans. But in this case, they were they were brothers in arms. They didn't want to fight each other, but they had to. And that the grim silence of that battle is absolutely eerie and just terrifying, I think. It's a vivid, vivid image. Let me also ask you about whether or not courage is learned or as it came through in Chernow's grant, you never quite know who's going to have it until the shots start to fire. And so if you haven't heard a shot fired in anger like I haven't, you have no idea uh, whether or not you're a coward or a courageous man. How do you learn it? I don't think you do. I think it's I think it's innate in every man. I think we underestimate our younger generation because they're so so uh, pacified by feminist culture. Uh, by the way, my next book, uh, my kind of compliment book to this book, will be about women and and feminine co culture and contributions to Western civilization. Quite different. Uh, Grant just never thought about it. If you read his own memoirs, he he marched right out onto the battlefield. He was shot. A uh, bullet bounced off the scabbard and sent his sword flying. Sherman sustained several minor wounds. Uh, horses were shot out from underneath him. But you never see in Grant, which is so, such an admirable quality, that he even thought about his own physical safety. Uh, neither does Caesar, by the way. Whenever the battle's going bad and Caesar's telling, Caesar puts on his big red cloak and walks to the front of the line and says, here I am, come and get me. Uh, they just had a belief in their own invulnerability, but if death came, it came randomly. There was nothing you could do about it. Uh, Custer believed in Custer luck right into to the end. He was shot multiple times as he was crashing his horse through Confederate lines and always walked away without a scratch until the last the last time when what had worked for him all his life didn't work anymore. In fact, uh, I will I remind people, General Lee would often try and rally troops in route, and he would go to the front until his troops would say, General Lee to the rear, General Lee to the rear, until they screamed him back and he would be led back to the back. Now, I want to go back to something you said worth dying for. My friend Archbishop Chaput has a new book coming up. It is titled, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, Things Worth Dying For. It's a meditation oh. on if you actually, I want you to repeat what you said. I've read his book already. He'll be a guest of mine. Courage actually comes from conviction right? Isn't that yes. actually what courage comes from? I think it comes from a sense of duty, too. Uh, no man wants to be considered a coward. The Romans dealt with cowards very drastically, as you know, they executed them. So if you were caught running from the battlefield, you were just as doomed as, as, uh, as if you had stayed. But the key about 
battlefield courage, I think, from all the soldiers I've known and talked to. My own brother is a Navy uh, officer as well, with long military tradition in my family. Uh, you, you do your duty because your duty is not to you or your country or your wife or your children. It's to the guy next to you on the line. The Romans, the whole function of both the phalanx and the maniples was to defend the man to your right. And, and, and when you break the line, you endanger the lives of every other man. And that's a huge moral burden for anybody. And I think that's the thing that keeps men in line as long as it does. Uh, very, if, if you break ranks and run, you will die. If you follow your training and stay there and fight, you have a chance of getting out. After all, most soldiers a, are not at the tip of the spear, B, are not in combat, and C, survive it. So your chances of getting, I know this is cold comfort when you're there, but the chances of you getting killed are relatively low, even in the, the most vicious pitched battles. Uh, but the key is to stand fast, and, and that's something that uh, we, we can't forget. If we're now, Dan, I, have not, I haven't finished last stand, so I have no idea if you interweave your vast knowledge of culture into this, but the best movie portrayal of courage is saving private ryan going ashore i mean it opens with courage going ashore at normandy and yeah. tom hanks where's the rally point anybody anywhere but here i love that line but his handshake it's not the absence of fear which would no, actually no. be sociopathic right Right. No, you don't want a guy who wants to get killed on the battlefield. You don't want that guy in your unit. You want a guy that's going to make sure you get home. Uh, and and that's, that movie is so stunning in its depiction. And, and veterans wept when they saw that, as I recall, when it first came out. They said, this is the closest thing to reality that we've ever seen. Yeah, I sat next to a, an older man in a Beverly Hills cinema who sobbed through the whole thing. Obviously a World War II veteran. Obviously, yeah. a World War II veteran. So uh, as you go back through this, has it changed from time immemorial? You are back in ancient Rome, and you are as recent as chosen. I don't know that you do anything on Vietnam, although you could do Khe Sanh at Vietnam. That was a pretty remarkable display of courage. On, on, on uh, There were lots of battles in Marines uh, and Army fought in Vietnam. And, of course, Fallujah, one and two. And you'll find lots of battles today where there's a lot of courage, and you'll find courage in the skies. And on the seas, did you happen to see the new Tom Hanks movie about the Battle of the North Atlantic? No, I have not yet. It, well, it's just courage in tin boats because there are just a thousand U-boats out there shooting at these convoys. So did it change over the period of time? Last Stands begins early and runs over the sweep of history. Has it changed at all? No, I don't think it's changed at all. And I think people who argue that we'll never have to confront that again, there won't be massed infantry battles, uh, you know, on the plains outside of uh, Germany that, where the Soviet tanks are rolling. I think that's wrong. I think uh, even if we live in a push button age of warfare where we can destroy ourselves, the Chinese and whoever else is the enemy du jour by a push of a button, most people are still going to survive that. And there's still going to be hand to hand combat. If that happens in a post-apocalyptic world, that hand-to-hand -hand combat takes you right back to Kane. It takes you right back to the nose of your opponent between your teeth. And you're going to want men that can fight that because they're the only ones who can. And to discount it and to dismiss it as an artifact of ancient history is so typical in a way of, of the way Americans tend to think. They all kind of agree with Henry Ford that history is bunk. Uh, and let's just hope we'd ever have to find out whether that's true or not. But, you know, military people don't. Last Stands reminded me of what I learned in Chernow and what I learned from General Mattis is that uh, Chernow's grant is that the great generals read constantly in military history grant could yes. recite with detail napoleon's campaigns though he despised the man mattis is a walking talking encyclopedia of generals in battles so i think to a certain extent you can study tactics but you can only live courage i mean that's what they try and teach you at the military academies and in basic training and at OCS and at Paris Island, if you're enlisted man or Marine Corps Depot, they try and teach it to you, but you can only learn military battles by studying military battles. Uh, yeah, that and one other thing that I, as, as a cultural uh, uh, historian, I like to get my oar in here. Both Grant and Custer were very well read uh, in terms of literature. And also in terms of the theater, they both enjoyed going to see plays. Uh, you see this constantly during Grant's time in New York, uh, during Custer's time in New York when he was trying to get some financial stuff going. Uh, they're always going to the theater. It, it, this has been a lot, maybe uh, Mattis, I think, understands this uh, as well. But 
American military officers found comfort and lessons in not only historians, but in creative people like Shakespeare. Uh, the, I guarantee you Grant was an expert in Shakespeare. I, but most Americans were in the 19th century. But the whole notion of, of the culture that they're fighting for is something that's sometimes discounted when you just deal in terms of tanks and planes and infantry regiments. But uh, acculturation was a very important part of the military upbringing and as, as you know and I know certainly from growing up with marine officers and being around I grew up actually uh, on the MCRD base in San Diego when as, as a small boy uh, these are very well read intelligent and in my case <laughs> Jesuit educated half of partly American Indian Irish warriors so uh, I, does it get any worse than that I I, I don't know I mean, that's well I, I did not grow up in a military family though my father had served I, I but I will tell people a story I've often told the first time I met my father-in-law Colonel Helmer I sat down and I was picking up his daughter to take her out on a date and we were 22 first question he asked me first question what do you know about Chesty Puller and he's sitting in a chair with a with a bookcase full of Marines, and I had to say nothing. And so I got, you know, he kind of waved that off. And then when I showed up to get married, he looked at my shoes at the Rance House Chapel in Pendleton, and you at least could have shined your shoes. Marines are different people. I want to close this way. You are also a music critic. Yeah. To what extent does music encourage, is music in last stands? Are there uh, connections? It's yeah, uh, uh, yes and no. I mean, I talk about, for example, uh, Brooks' cantata called Arminius, which was about Hermann, the the uh, uh, German warrior who destroyed the Romans uh, at the Teutoburg Forest. Uh, uh, but I left it out mostly because it just didn't quite fit into the whole overall thing. I will say this. Most armies go to war with a band. Custer had a band. The Romans made noises. They had trumpets and uh, th th things similar to our French horns. Uh, the Chinese attacked with cymbals and, and gongs. My father said the eeriest thing about seeing them coming down the hill was this unearthly noise they made. Music or noise is so much part of the battlefield environment. Uh, it's almost worth a whole book, but uh, I've got a few others ahead of that right now, I must say. So how is Last Stands doing? Are you surprised by its reception? Uh, everyone's thrilled. It's selling, uh, I think the last time we looked, a thousand copies a week. Uh, it's been at the top of multiple bestseller lists uh, on Amazon. We we sold out, in fact, on day one. Uh, I was very pleased to see, and in a way it hurt a bit because it was the holidays and with the COVID panic, uh, it was hard to get it back into stock as quickly as we wanted it to, but it's fully in stock now. It's selling, as my editor said, like iPhones, and it really seems to be resonating, Hugh, in, a, in the breasts of uh, women especially. I get letters every day saying, I loved this book. I heard you read it on Audible. I went out and bought three copies and gave them to every man I know. I, I, we're kind of starting a movement here, I hope, of a, a, a masculine recrudescence, and that would be a very good thing for America in these per perilous times. Did you read the book for, for the audiobook? Yes, I did, yeah. So the pronunciation will be there? Uh, well, it's as good as I can, as close as I can get. I mean, I, uh, yeah, it's the, the, the early- Oh, books... I mean, Michael, you've just changed my approach. I, I listened to Grant, and it takes hours and hours and hours, but the reason to listen to books, if you're a great reader when you're young, you can't pronounce anything. And because you know, you don't know how to pronounce things. And so as you, what's this battle that I can't pronounce? What's that all about? Sigetvar. It's a battle between the Hungarians and the Croatians against Suleiman the Magnificent, the Turkish commander in the, in the 16th century. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to have to listen. I'm going to go buy, I got your, I got it for free, but now I'm going to go buy your audio book, Michael Walsh. Oh, thank because, you. Thank you. Because I love to listen. I didn't know that you had read it. I love it. The guy who read Grant was just terrific. But uh, when authors read their own works, unless they're doing it as a, did you try and put some drama in it? Yes, I do. I even do uh, some a small bit of accents, trying to reproduce my father's native Bostonian honk uh, during the parts where I quote him. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm I'm a linguist, so there's. Uh, you know, I had 11 languages in The Fiery Angel, so that was a pretty tough one. Uh, but you know, you'll get to hear me read in multiple tongues in this book, I must say. Michael Walsh, thank you for the long interview. We will be back as we come back to various books. And I, I encourage everyone to go out and get uh, Last Stands, Why Men Fight When All Is Lost. Thank you, Michael Walsh. Thanks, you.
This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success, for instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. The Biden administration is rolling back religious liberty and doing all kinds of things that are very serious, very far reaching. Uh, tell us about what the Biden administration has done with regard to uh, athletes, transgender athletes. Well, on day one of the Biden administration, he issued an executive order telling all of the agencies that you need to start enshrining the gender identity into regulations and specifically called out sports and athletics. And we know firsthand what happens when policies like that pop up. Uh, in Connecticut, we've got four young uh, female athletes, very courageous, incredibly talented runners, and found themselves competing against two biological males. And these were guys that at one season had been competing on the males team where they were mid-level athletes, few weeks later switched to the female team and suddenly at the top of the podium time and time again. And so there was over 16 instances where girls lost out on championships or had records broken or lost instances where they were able to advance into competition, um, all because these two biological males came to dominate. And that was, again, just two guys in Connecticut. Now imagine we start rolling this out across the country. All it takes is a handful of biological males to, to destroy women's sports as we know it, where girls end up being spectators in their own sport. Um, one of the girls describes how disheartening it is. You walk up to the starting line and you look over and you see a biological male next to you. You know the race is already lost. You know you don't have a chance. And that's exactly what the Biden administration's policy is. It's put into effect is going to cause for women and for all athletes across the country. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Uh, Donald Trump, of okay. course, is, is complaining about the election, claiming the election is stolen, uh, and he mm -hmm. is being accused of engaging in conspiracy theories. Is it what about ism, mm -hmm. Paul? I'm asking. I'm really asking. I'm not. I'm not fighting with you. I'm asking. Is it what about ism to bring right. up the fact that Hillary, for four years, has used the S word, stolen, and has for four years referred to Donald Trump as illegitimate? And people on CNN and MSNB, hee haw, the ones that are accusing Donald Trump of undermining our, the integrity of our elections by using the S word, stolen, uh, when they don't say that about Hillary. Am I engaging in whataboutism, or am I talking about hypocrisy? No, you, you are 100% correct. You're talking about you're using whataboutism, and you're using hypocrisy. Okay, but that's that's not my point. Is, is it? Is it? That's that's kind of what I'm trying to say. Is it okay for Donald Trump to not accept the election? Morning, glory, America. Bonjour. Hi, Canada. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I screwed up last hour, and I'm allowed to because it's my birthday. 65 years young today and vaccine eligible. So I screwed up last hour. I had not taped my usual cover for relieffactor.com. When I do a long interview, and I'm going to continue the interview through the break and into the new break and then out of the break and into the post break and then put it up at my podcast, the interview, I normally remember 
And maybe it's because I turned 65, I'm losing my memory. I normally remember to cover it. So I have to do a bonus for my sponsor, Relief Factor. And it's very appropriate because on Saturday I did eight and a half miles, yesterday I did 10, and today I do eight. And the reason is I wanted to do a 72 hour marathon. Now it's the longest marathon I've ever completed. Uh, the last one I did, I was 50. It was the LA Marathon. I hurt myself pretty badly and took a long time to recover from that. And uh, the, the deal was I wanted to run one in my 60s, but I'm not sure I can actually get back to 26.2 miles again. But I can do it over three days. So I decided I would do it the two days before I turn 65 and then add the eight miles that I need later this afternoon. So that's where the relief factor will come in. Already a little bit sore. But uh, relieffactor.com, 1995, go get it. I tell you, I swear by it. I take it every day. I took it in the first hour. I remind you two more times. The, uh, the last stand conversation with Michael Walsh is incredible. And it will now be in its entirety posted at the interview, which is my new podcast. I just decided I am going to fight back against the dying of the light for long form interviews. They're no longer available on television anywhere. When I had the lowest rated show in MSNBC history called Hugh Hewitt, I would have in authors to talk for 15 minutes. Admiral Stavridis, other people, Jake Tapper. And I, and I did that for the simple reason that I thought the long form interview ought to endure. And they didn't like it. Nobody liked it. It was the lowest rated show. Of course, it was on at 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday after an infomercial. So I don't think it was set up to succeed. But I'm not going to abandon the form. And that's why I'm doing it occasionally using the radio format or at least beginning the interview in the last segment of the show and going along with it and then putting it over at the interview. But if you want those, if you're a podcast nut and you want the best in podcasts, well, that would be mine. Uh, let me quickly tell you the good news other than the fact that I'm vaccine eligible. By the way, if, if you're in California and you're vaccine eligible, that means you might get it by the time you're 70. Uh, because it's really screwed up out here. Well, I'll, I'll keep you posted. If I find it today, I'll tell you about it. Um, the White House has changed its tone again about reopening schools. I think they're embarrassed because I think America is mad. And so now they're kind of maybe we'll reopen schools sooner than we said, and we won't use that Jen Psaki standard of one day of in-classroom work for the elementary kids by the end of this year. Uh, this this school year. And that's really looking ridiculous because Great Britain, everybody's going back to school on March 8th, as is the case, as everyone should be going back to school. China's state broadcaster has applied to France for the right to air in Europe. Let me say, no, no. Not only have you killed tens of millions of people around the world with your negligence at best in Wuhan, and you may have been more than negligent. You also have an ongoing genocide in your country, and we're not going to let you broadcast propaganda in our country. Uh, the, uh, the, the New York Times suggests we have an economic boom on our horizon. Who would have thought that the New York Times would predict a boom at the start of the Biden years? Who would have thought? You know, it's just sometimes I'm so surprised by stuff. Um, the SNL, Saturday Night Live, is under under assault because Michael Shea said this, cut number 10 on Saturday night. Israel is reporting that they vaccinated half of their population. And I'm gonna guess it's the Jewish half. <laughs> That's a little anti-Semitic. Actually, it's a lot anti-Semitic. And um, no apology yet from Saturday Night Live. Uh, Fred Hyatt, uh, who is the boss of the opinion section for which I work at the Washington Post. I'm not obliged to promote his op-eds, but he's got one out today. If it will put this man in jail, China will stop at nothing. And we already know they've got a million Uyghurs in concentration camps, and they've suppressed Hong Kong, and they've let the virus go. We know that. But there's a little old man in China, Martin Lee. He's a threat to nobody. And the Chinese are putting him on trial. Go read Fred Hyatt's column. And then please go read mine. It's in the uh, Post paper today. It's an appeal to the GOP Senate, to those who I know well, like Senator Cotton, those I do not know at all, those with whom I have fought, like Ron Johnson, and those with whom I have been friendly, like Susan Collins, to the leader and John Thune, 
and the youngest member, all of them, to go see Joe Manchin and decide jointly to confirm Nira Tandon. Now, Nira is not a friend. I've met her many times. I mean, she's left me lying and bleeding on many stages. She's pummeled me on Twitter. She's uh, dissected me on air, and it's okay, because I'm a grown man, and it's politics. And politics ain't beanbag, as the uh, Mr. Dooley used to say. And it's not beanbag online. That's really the only thing they have against. Now, she's a lefty. She's not as lefty as Bernie Sanders. She took Bernie Sanders apart online, too, so he's mad at her, too. And my message to the United States Senate is, uh, you can take one of two tacks. One is we're grown up and we will live by the same rules as everyone. And if other people get chewed up by Twitter, we're going to get chewed up by Twitter. But the better way would be to say, we could turn down Neera Tandon like we could have turned down Rick Grinnell on the basis of mean tweets. But we're not going to do that. We're going to instead declare amnesty. And we're going to make it a very big and public deal. And this is my argument in the Washington Post. What would Ted Lasso do? Ted dispenses mercy all the time. So collectively, you get Collins and Cotton and Manchin and a few others, and you walk out there and you say, over the line, relentless, tough, acid, bad. We don't like it. It hurts. It wounds. And we want America to be better. But there's no chance that people will change if they're already committed and we don't declare Ali Ali in free. So we're giving an amnesty to social media, not for threats, not for abusive tweets that are sexist or part of the Me Too movement, not for any of that, no. But for the political stuff that's gotten out of hand, we've gone back to sort of 19th century standards and they were brutal, right? I used to call Abraham Lincoln a, a monkey, a chimpanzee, a gorilla. Uh, they, were, they were brutal. And we've gone back to that online, and it's time to stop. So the opportunity to stop is now. And the way to do it is to say, we on the Republican side, and we've been pretty brutal on Twitter, including President Trump, including a lot of people in Trump's orbit, and we want it to stop. So we're going to make the first move. Now, we got Joe Manchin, we got in a room, we all came out, and we said, okay, Neera Tannen's qualified, she's very smart, and she's a liberal, but we're going to overlook that. We're going to go full Ted Lasso, and we're going to dispense mercy in the way that Grant did at Appomattox, the way that Grant fought for throughout the Reconstruction. I may be too influenced by the fact I just finished Chernow's grant over the weekend. But I really think this is necessary. Ty in San Antonio, what do you think, Ty? Hey, Hugh, I, I don't mean this as an insult. I mean this factually. I've always viewed you as a liberal in sheep's clothing, and I think this is another example of it. If you think that we're going to find common ground by confirming this person uh, based on, you know, traditional decorum and the way that we've done things, I don't know where you've been over the past five, six, seven, eight years. What makes well, we're not going to find common ground, Ty. That's not my point. We're, I'm never going to agree with Neera Tandon, and I am never going to vote Democratic. And if you think I'm a liberal in sheep's clothing, you haven't listened to the show. But uh, having voted twice for Trump and for Romney and twice for Bush and for every Republican, I've never voted for a Democrat in a general election ever. And uh, I'm a Republican, but I'm arguing for an amnesty so that our future people on both sides have a chance to get confirmed. Did you think Rick Grinnell was a good confirmation person? I think Rick Grinnell is fine, and I'm all for free speech. And I don't think that you should be, um, you know, singled out or, or canceled because of tweets. I think that's the world we live in. Social media is a huge part of our society. But here's the thing. We are losing. You dropped out there, Ty. The forum, or or we, 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 we keep looking for common ground with these people. I'm not looking sure. for common ground. I, I, I got to go to break. I'm not cutting you. I'm not looking for common ground. I don't expect it. I'm going to oppose everything they do. I'm looking for an amnesty on Twitter so that everyone can make a choice right now to go forward and be not confirmed in the future or have it erased prior to 
February 22nd, 2021. Thank you. I'll be right back, America. Trending now on The Charlie Kirk Show. Just everyone is now taking a moment for good reason to remember a true American hero. And, you know, I really never spoke publicly a lot about this, but I had the opportunity to get to know Rush very well. And Rush was someone that supported Turning Point in a variety of different ways. He was someone that I had the opportunity to have many different meetings with and get advice and counsel from. He was always so kind and courteous, gracious and humble. I remember the first time I met Rush, he was uh, golfing at a certain uh, country club in Palm Beach and was so incredibly magnanimous, wanted to meet me, uh, ask questions about Turning Point. I remember we had breakfast together. He only ate bacon for breakfast. And I always always remember that. He said that the grease made him smarter. So maybe that's a lesson for all of us. And the years that came, Rush then spoke at two of our events, uh, one of the events being our Turning Point USA Student Action Summit, uh, where we had the opportunity to have Rush and President Trump. I think this was the last public speaking event Rush ever did uh, in Palm Beach when Rush introduced uh, President Trump at our event. And it was unbelievable. And we'll be posting clips and from there. And what I can say about Rush is that he did so much for so many people and even things for me and for Turning Point that I can't even mention, but I can just say they were unbelievable. It was really incredible. The generosity, the spirit, and how he cared for this country. You know, when I was in the White House uh, visiting many times my friend Avi or Jared or Kaylee McEnany, you know what a lot of people would be talking about in the White House? They'd say, hey, did you hear what Rush had to say earlier in the day? It was the White House that was talking about Rush. Not always Rush that was talking about the White House. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on America First with Sebastian Gorka. Nobody voted for that. If they did, Biden would have campaigned on that. He virtually said nothing about this. But it wasn't a secret, Jim. It wasn't. Well, it wasn't a secret, but he didn't say anything, right? He didn't give people to vote against him. You know, it came up once in the third debate and he got so hammered for it, he never mentioned it again. So they do not have a mandate to do something that not just 50, because we say, oh, well, 50% are over here with Trump and 50% are over there with those guys. This isn't a 50-50 thing. Most Americans don't, don't want their communities to be less safe. Yeah. They don't want some people to have an, more advantages and benefits than actual American citizens have. And they don't want more COVID. And they don't want more COVID, and they don't want to bear the unbelievable costs of housing everybody from Latin America. I don't know who said it, but a wise man said uh, you can have uh, open borders and no welfare system. You can have a welfare system and closed borders, but you can't have open borders and a welfare state. We're talking to Jim Carafano of the Heritage Foundation. Follow him now, JJ Carafano. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmer said, said. He possesses one of the secrets of success, for instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu.
I, uh, I never, you never get to go backwards, but you can always look forwards. And I wish I had known then what I know now, which is um, when Twitter was unleashed upon the world, they ought to have put out a notification to everyone. That what you say will be used against you in a confirmation in the future. It would never have occurred to anyone that confirmation would have become this crazy. So it requires Republicans and conservatives to say now, that the rule we adopted for Rick Grinnell, which was it was stupid to use Rick's mean tweets to stop him. And he was confirmed for ambassador to Germany. And I believe it is stupid to use tweets to stop a nominee until you've just declared that's going to be the rule. And so I want Republicans to confirm Neera Tannen. She is not a friend of mine. I know her from sets. Uh, I never had a cup of coffee with her. All I've done is duel with her and I usually lost. And sometimes quite embarrassingly so. She's sharp-witted. She's smart. She would be a great director of OMB. And Joe Manchin and Susan Collins, who I, 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 look, Susan Collins is, along with Tom Cotton, probably my favorite senator. And I, you know, one's one of the most conservative and one's one of the most moderate. But they approach the business of being senators very, like Leader McConnell, like John Thune, very, very, uh, thoughtfully. And that's what senators should do. And I think they ought to rethink this. Go see Joe Manchin. And both Susan Collins and Joe Manchin have said, I'm not voting for Neera Tannen. I think they ought to rethink it, get a bunch of Republicans and Joe Manchin come out and say, we changed our mind. But listen, henceforth, beginning today, February 22nd, 2021, we aren't going to, we're giving out no more passes for Twitter. You want to come before this Senate and get confirmed, conduct yourself the way senators do, which isn't always great, by the way, but they don't, they don't often, they play hardball on Twitter, but not as hard as some people play. What do you think, Diane in South Carolina? What, what say you, Diane? Um, morning. I was just, uh, had the thought that possibly now is the time, like you said, until we uh, make them suffer consequences. Um, maybe now's the time for the Senate to stand up and say, this is wrong. And because of these tweets, we made a, made a, made a mistake with previously, but going forward, we cannot have people on our, running our government that, that are out there making slanderous against other people, whether, whatever party they are, and make this the new standard. And maybe, I mean, sooner or later, we have to start taking a stand against these hateful tweets. Well, well, hateful and tough are different. I, I, would not, I would not approve anyone who'd use racist or violent language. But I do think it is an opportunity that allows both parties, very high profile, and it's a cabinet member, it's not an ambassador, to walk out and say, we have a new standard. Just what you said, Diane. And coming, henceforward, we have an amnesty. That's all the only inference. Amnesties. That's what Lee did with the Confederacy. Your men are paroled. They may not take up arms against the Union and go home with your animals and farm. And it just struck me, we need an amnesty on this stuff because it's going to become crazy. And it's also instructive to let people know going forward, February 23rd, 2021, we're not going to do it again. This is it. And we're doing it. The Republicans are doing it with Joe Manchin in order to establish a marker for everyone. And delete your tweet account if you want or don't, but don't expect forgiveness second. Thank you, Diane. Got to do a market update brought to you by andrewandtodd.com. Andrewandtodd.com, longtime sponsors of the show. They are the best mortgage lenders in America. They were Sierra Pacific Mortgage. If you're old fashioned, you want to call someone. I just want to call someone to get an appointment for a vaccine, right? That's not allowed. I have to go through 85 websites, none of which work. Uh, I've been up since, you know, forever before the show trying half-heartedly to get a vaccine appointment. That's not going to happen. But if you go to andrewandtodd.com and answer a couple of questions, they'll actually get back to you, unlike Othena in Orange County, California. 888 888-888-1172. 888-888-1172. Call Andrew and Todd and get a loan today before these interest rates go away. Don't get left behind, America. Don't get left behind. I'm Hugh Hewitt. I'll be right back. Stay tuned. Portions of the Hugh Hewitt Show brought to you by Sierra Pacific Mortgage. For more info, call 888-888-1172. Thank you. 
trending now on the Eric Metaxas Show. Madness. Most people know this is madness. When you see a young man who suddenly decides that not only does he want to identify as a woman, he wants to compete against women, you know, who have quadriceps half the size of his. He's going to be a better sprinter. He's going to be able to do all kinds of stuff because he says, now I'm a girl. Look, look I, I don't think we're talking about wanting to persecute people. This is very complicated stuff. But my goodness, this is pretty basic stuff. Wasn't there just an MMA fighter or something that, that uh, a guy who identifies as a woman and he crushed the woman's skull. I mean, I'm not making this up. I couldn't even believe it when I read it. D uh, do you know about this case? I did, yeah. And I believe the, the uh, fighter's last name was Fox. I don't remember the, the first name. But yeah, it was an MMA fight. And um, his opponent, I mean, just her, I think, uh, some broken bones and some things like that. And this shows it, it's not even just a matter of, of – fairness of making sure women get to compete but it's a matter of safety because you start taking this into sports like mma like soccer like others where you've got some physical contact going on and we've had girls reach out to us to say i have genuine concerns that if i go out into the field and i get you know slammed into by a guy is that going to be the end of my athletic career and i think that shows there are so many reasons why we've had men's teams and women's teams and we need to preserve those for equal opportunities for safety and just for making sure that our daughters and granddaughters don't find themselves sitting on the sidelines uh, when they ought to be out there winning the gold medal and using their God-given talents to their fullest. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Larry Elder Show. Now, I want to talk about this high school football coach, Massachusetts. He's suing Dedham Public School uh, District, fired for privately disagreeing with the school's social justice curriculum being taught to his children. Now, because they're doing online training, kids are at home, and this football coach is hearing what they're learning in world history. Kind of thought that they were going to learn something about, oh, I don't know, you know, world history. Instead, one assignment asked 12 and 13 year olds to identify risk factors and mitigation factors when walking down the street with a person of a different skin color. White students were told to be fearful when they saw a black student with quote, aggressive body language or in the quote, wrong neighborhood, close quote. And black students were told to be fearful of white people in general, especially the police. And he and his wife noticed that the seventh grade teacher had a cartoon character of herself with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on. So he contacted the superintendent, concerned about the curriculum that had been changed without notifying the parents that the coursework was not suitable for seventh grade students. The teacher was not teaching world history. So following the email, superintendent holds a meeting with the Flins, with the, uh, the, the couple complaining. And uh, next thing you know, he has been uh, fired from his job as a coach. And I sent a letter. Quote, we are writing today. Sorry to inform you that you will not be reappointed as head coach. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. This is the response from Larry Elder to me. <laughs> Dennis, I feel about that office the way Walter Cronkite felt when asked if he'd like to be a senator. He said, I'd love to serve, I'd hate to run. I have neither the temperament, the stomach, the passion, nor the will to run. <laughs> and if elected... I would not have the desire to spend my last years on earth busting heads with those doofuses in Sacramento. Apart from that, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so I sent it to the pastor, and he writes back, thank you for the response, and I must say, I agree with him. 
<laughs> That's after urging him to run. <laughs> Shimon says, I'd have a big bully pulpit if I were governor of California. Uh, I, I would have a big bully pulpit if I were president or vice president of the United States. But otherwise, this, this national radio show is a much bigger a pulpit. With PragerU, this, columns, I have a huge, thank God, bully pulpit. Because all I want to do is influence people. I don't want to have any power over them. I am touched, though. Uh, it would be, I mean, the thought of me negotiating with team Welcome back, America. It's Hugh Hewitt. On my birthday, 65 years young and vaccine eligible, talking with Dan Balls of my generation. Dan, I always believed 1956 was the best year because Laugh-In was risque and the Alamo could be watched uncynically and Time Magazine mattered and girls wore tube tops and hot pants when I was carrying about. What do you think? You think 19, the mid-50s were the best years? Hugh, you're such a child. <laughs> you're so young. I don't understand it. Well, did you get your vaccine yet? Because navigating that is turning out to be like the impossible maze in California. We have gotten our, uh, we've gotten shot number one, and we get the next one in a few weeks. So we 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 are fortunate, but it's a uh, it's a struggle to to get uh, get set up. I mean, it's a uh, you know, if you're computer literate, uh, you have a better shot at it if you're not and so and the inequality of it is you know is painfully evident um we can see it all around um i mean everybody you know everybody wants you know once you're at that eligible age everybody wants to get a shot and the system is you know it's chopped up um you know you can sign up for this that and the other place to try to get it but there's no guarantee of it and slots and they won't and put phone people. numbers on the side stand and I, you're right i'm computer literate and i, I can get, make my way around as you can but i do worry about older people who are not computer literate need a phone need to talk to somebody live and can't do it that's the unfortunate we, we, we know some people there is a phone number uh we live in in maryland in the uh, dc suburbs there is a phone number that people have been able to use and with success. Uh, we know some people who just late last week were able to use the, the phone line and get set up. Um, but it's, well, it, it, it is. It's, a, it's an enormous frustration for people. Now, Dan, I want to propose something radical. In the post today, I have a, a column in the paper edition as well as online urging Republicans and by extension Joe Manchin to change their minds on near attendance. And my thinking is this. Uh, Rick Grinnell got confirmed. He's a friend of mine, and he had done a lot of mean tweets. And a whole bunch of people have done. You haven't. You're, you're Mr. Gentleman. But a whole bunch of people have done mean tweets over their career since social media kind of evolved spontaneously. And they figure once they're over the line, they're going to stay over the line. Not, not racist, not sexist, not violent, but just mean. And Nera, who is, I, I don't know except on set. She's not a friend of mine, and, and I've got more scars than Zorro villains from Nera. Uh, I just think it's crazy to establish a new standard for nominees that mean tweets have been directed at senators. Is there any chance we could get a reset that Manchin and Collins might get together and say, okay, here's the deal. We'll let her through, but henceforward, people, you know, 222, 21, we're watching your Twitter account. Any chance at all? It seems unlikely, Hugh. Uh, maybe, your, uh, maybe your column will uh, make people rethink it. Um, I mean, it's a fair point. I mean, it, you know, social media is a, you know, is a, is an animal that, you know, that kind of got out of control. Uh, and in terms of partisan stuff, yeah, lots of people have said nasty things in a partisan way. Um, but should that disqualify them? Because it, 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 it's not as though Mira Tandon's the only person who's ever done a, you know, a tough or mean or nasty tweet aimed at a political opponent. Um, you know, this is this is the nature of social media. And, and I think it's one reason why people are ambivalent about social media, because it, it encourages that sort of thing. It, 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 you know, one thing stokes another and it becomes a kind of an arms race um, of, 
you know, nasty tweets. So, but in, in, at this point, I would be surprised if Manchin or Collins took it back. Yeah, it, it would require them really rethinking. My, my concern, Dan Balls, is that everyone under the age of 40, and I mean everyone, is going to be disqualified by this. And I remember going through the White House clearance process when I was in the White House counsel's office, and we had a, a question about past drug use. And Bob Tuttle, at one point, who was President Reagan's personnel czar, said, we're just not going to pay attention to marijuana, or we're not going to be able to put anybody into this administration. And at some point, you've just got to declare an amnesty for that which was previously unacceptable that has become acceptable. And I don't want to make Twitter acceptable, but my God, we won't, there won't be anyone under 40 who's going to be able to be confirmed. Well, that, I mean, that, that's the problem. But at some point, there will be, you know, that amnesty will be declared. But, it, but the, first, the first times it comes up, as it did with marijuana, um, people, you know, people were disqualified from positions. And eventually then, you know, later, you know, cooler heads prevailed. And, and you know, people like Tuttle and, and many others, frankly, said, look, um, we've just got to, you know, we've got to recognize that this is a generation um, that's going to put this on their, you know, on their forms. And are we going to, are we going to let that stand in the way of people who are, you know, otherwise completely highly qualified? So um, yeah, people will not remember, but Doug Ginsburg, a yeah, terrific sure. judge on the DC circuit was nominated to fill the vacancy created by the rejection of Robert Bork and withdrew his nomination when it turned out he had smoked marijuana with some students at Harvard law school. This was in 1987. Now that will stun people. Uh, but it was not; con it was considered automatic back then. I, well, but then, I, I don't. As you, <laughs> go ahead. As you remember, at that point, that that then set off a round of questions of all kinds of politicians. Have you ever, you know, have you ever used marijuana? And it put a lot of politicians, younger politicians, in a very uncomfortable position, and they had to figure out how to, you know, how to maneuver it. And you know, the the classic Bill Clinton line in <clears throat> 1991: "I never broke the laws of my country," uh, or "I didn't," you know. I mean it. You know, <laughs> early Clintonism. Yep. Early Clintonism. Yeah. The non-answer yeah. answer. answer. Uh, yeah. I also remember the nanny gate that that plagued his first two nominees for attorney general. And I believe what happened there is that everyone started paying their nannies. Right. And doing citizenship checks or getting services to provide their nannies because they didn't want to get clipped like uh, the two AG. But as to political rhetoric, Dan, you're a student of history. It's always been fierce, but it was never written down and easily found. That's true, although I do think that it's, it is coarser. It is, has been consistently more, more coarse over the last years than it, than it was. I think it has ebbed and flowed. Yeah, political campaigns are tough uh, and always have been. And you can, you, know, you can go back and look at one campaign or another and find examples um, that, you know, that, that, that show... Um, you know stuff that's below the belt, frankly, and 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 that you know that you would say, well, you know, that was supposed to be a you know the 1950s. That was a nice era, Hugh, as you said. Uh, but you know, but political campaigns have always been tough. But I think the day in day out nature of it, and I think you know, I think cable and social media have exacerbated that. Um, and I I don't know any way that we're going to you know kind of unwind that. Um, I mean, it would be good if we could. But I don't know that we're going to be able to. Yeah, the best way is to find a marker on which to declare, here's the amnesty. And you don't get it. And when Grant accepted the surrender at Appomattox, the men kept their arms and their animals, but they couldn't fight anymore. Uh, so you can you can go forward and have conversations, but don't do it. Dan Balls, you've seen a lot of new administrations and you've graded a lot of uh, first 100 days. How do you think Team Biden is starting? Uh. Hugh, I guess I would say that uh, on in terms of tone and temperament, uh, quite good. I mean, I think he's been, you know, he's been conscious and deliberate about trying to set a different tone and to, and to you know basically lower the temperature uh, in, in in the way he has talked about things and said things. Um, I think they get good marks on that. I think that um, they have moved aggressively. Um, and I think that they see the problems as, as sizable. I don't think anybody disagrees with that, that the, what he inherited uh, is, as, you know, is as challenging as any president since Roosevelt and maybe worse. Um, and they, have, they, they came in. I think they had a good transition plan. I think they knew what they wanted to do when they started out. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're, 
obviously running into some problems as all administrations do. They've got a problem with the size of the of the COVID relief package, and and that's still going to have to work its way through the Senate. I think it'll get through the House reasonably easily, but the, when it gets to the Senate, there's still negotiations that are going to have to be done. Um, and it wouldn't surprise me. I don't think it would surprise anybody who's been watching this that it doesn't end up at $1.9 trillion. Where, where it ends up, I can't say at this point, but I think there's negotiation. And I think Biden is probably <clears throat> aware of that and open to it. And he's already signaled that the $15 minimum wage is not going to survive. And we'll see what, what other changes are made. Um, They've clearly they've clearly gotten themselves into a, you know, into a bind on reopening schools um, yes. and trying and trying to navigate between the science and the and the, the teachers unions. And frankly, um, you know, individual school districts. I mean, this is not a federal <clears throat> the, the federal government doesn't run the schools, as we know, and and, uh, and the country doesn't want the federal government to run the schools. So how does how does uh, how does President Biden um, get the right? get the right, um, not just science, but guidelines so that local schools can feel confident about what they're doing. But I think that almost no matter what the federal government says, there's going to be debates at the local level over this because, well, just because we all know that people have different views of how serious and how severe the risks are of putting kids and teachers back in, you know, in crowded classrooms or, or even this, social This is Dan... Classrooms. Uh, this is the first rule of holes test. Uh, they have fallen into a hole on schools. They've got to get out of it because it's making political. People have previously not been political and not in a good way for Team Biden. It's, it's radicalizing parents who are suffering. They need to open these schools in a hurry. And they need to make sure that their union colleagues understand that. And I didn't see that yesterday. Did you see any retreat from confusion yesterday on the Sunday shows? Not particularly, but I think, I mean, I think we need some perspective on this. This is, this has been a debate that has been going on since last summer. Um, and obviously we've gone through a very, a terrible period since then, uh, you know, the November, December, January spike, uh, in cases and deaths, um, it was much more severe than, than the late summer. So, um, this is a debate that people have not been able to resolve. And I, I agree with you. I think that parents are, you know, at their wits end with this. And, and, the, and, and beyond the parents, I mean, the damage to young children um, and is, you know, is, is potentially enormous. And I think, I think people recognize that. Um, but finding a consensus, um, you know, school district to school district, state to state, and the nation as a whole still is is elusive and i you know i i think you're right the biden team has gotten themselves into a into a kind of a political moment on this and they they they've got to try to figure out how to get out of it but i don't know that they've got a solution dan balls always a pleasure to talk to you follow him on twitter at dan balls i uh i know that if the san francisco private schools are open and the san francisco public schools are closed and that is the case democrats have a problem dan good to talk to you let me remind everyone of relieffactor.com as i told people i'm not bragging though i'm bragging uh, i'm doing the uh, 72 hour marathon that means uh, eight and a half miles on saturday 10 miles yesterday eight miles today so a marathon over three days because i can no longer do a marathon i used to do it when i was a kid when i was in my 20s and 30s and it was easy i even did one at 50 but that that caused major problems so i'm not making that mistake again but relieffactor.com allows exercise walking running trundling which is the difference between running and walking when you're doing both because you're old that is relieffactor.com the opportunity to feel better every day and i carry in kirkham and resveratrol omega i take it in the first hour i remind you about it in the next two hours don't get left behind 1995 gets you started and put a bag in your car so that when you commute and you find yourself feeling poorly You'll just reach for the relieffactor.com. Josh Crosshour joins me next. Hotline Josh. Don't go anywhere, America. It's the Hugh Hewitt Show. Trending now on the Dennis Prager Show. This is the response from Larry Elder to me. <laughs> Dennis, I feel about that office the way Walter Cronkite felt when asked if he'd like to be a senator. He said, I'd love to serve 
I'd hate to run. I have neither the temperament, the stomach, the passion, nor the will to run. <laughs> and if elected, I would not have the desire to spend my last years on earth busting heads with those doofuses in Sacramento. Apart from that, dot, dot, dot. So I sent it to the pastor, and he writes back, Thank you for the response, and I must say, I agree with him. <laughs> That's after urging him to run. <laughs> Shimon says, I'd have a big bully pulpit if I were governor of California. Uh, I, I would have a big bully pulpit if I were president or vice president of the United States. But otherwise, this, this national radio show is a much bigger a pulpit. With PragerU, this, columns, I have a huge, thank God, bully pulpit. Because all I want to do is influence people. I don't want to have any power over them. I am touched, though. Uh, it would be, I mean, the thought of me negotiating with teachers' unions... <laughs> When I, when I believe they are such destructive forces in America that they have, they have harmed children more than any other single thing in the United States outside of, ch of direct child abuse. What am I going to say? Hey, it's great to see you guys. Great to meet with you. I can't do that, uh, to be honest. It isn't great to meet with them. I have contempt for teachers' unions. Utter, total contempt. Keep up with what's trending. Subscribe on YouTube today. This is Hugh Hewitt for townhall.com. Republicans would do well to stop fighting among themselves. Henry John Temple, Lord Palmerston, was the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the American Civil War. He's celebrated for saying many memorable things about politics, including his remark about an up-and-coming politician nearly 50 years his junior, the conservative Robert Cecil. Beware of that young man, Palmerston said. He possesses one of the secrets of success. For instead of defending himself and his cause, he attacks the other side. The GOP ought to ponder that observation as it considers its course as the loyal opposition. For all the talk about splits within the respective parties, the sharpest, deepest divide remains between the two parties. The GOP ought to attack the other side, not themselves. While in the minority, Republicans should attack the points of difference, drawing distinctions with Democrats and not with each other. Unless, of course, they'd like to remain in the minority. I'm Hugh Hewitt. Considering a career in politics? Consider Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy. Learn more at publicpolicy.pepperdine.edu. Welcome back, America. Hugh Hewitt, joined now by Hotline Josh, Josh Crashauer. Good morning, Josh. How are you? Good morning, Hugh. Good to be back. Well, I am trying to uh, argue with my Republican friends in the Senate and maybe Joe Manchin that they ought to give Neera Tandon a pass and give an amnesty to everyone on Twitter, maybe with a warning that going forward they'll be counted against them. Is there a prayer of it working? No. And Susan Collins coming out this morning officially. Uh, and, and by the way, Susan Collins was one of the Republicans that Neera Tandon attacked on Twitter pretty, pretty vociferously. Um, that, that was sort of a revenge is a dish best served cold in, in Washington. Uh, you know, she's unlike Mitt Romney's, I guess, still is a possibility. You can see. But, I, I, you know, look, the fact that Biden didn't compromise, didn't try to work more aggressively with Republicans on the stimulus package. I, I just don't see uh, any any way Republicans bail out. Uh, near a candidate, especially when you consider that it's a Democrat. It's Joe Manchin who's the one blocking her from, from, from being confirmed. I mean, it shows, it undermines the Democratic argument that this is merely partisan when you have someone like Manchin who has regrets or concerns, rather, about her, her degree of partisanship. They would have to go to Joe and get him because they can't, they can't saw off the limb on which he went out. And they'd have to go out together, Susan Collins and Joe Manchin and yeah, maybe Jim Langford, who is one of the guys like Chris Coll uh, like Chris Coons, who who kind of works behind the scenes, and Tim Scott to get everyone together, and just say, okay, it's not our. She's been tough on people. 
And I, you know, I, I write in the post today, I've got more scars than Zorro villains from Nira Tandon, but she's, and she's not a friend of mine. It's just that if we have the Twitter standard, Josh, who survives that? I mean, who well, under I mean, 40 is going to survive that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, Nira has come on my podcast. She's attacked me on Twitter. I had her on, our, on my show. I mean, that, 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 I, you know, I, a lot of people take things on Twitter personally. I think that's, that's not a healthy thing to do. But senators especially take this stuff personally, and she's personally attacked a lot of Republicans in pretty aggressive ways. So that's not a way to make friends when you're in a top type moment yourself. Um, and, and, you know, it, it really, I think it really does come down to Mitt Romney if Mitt Romney decides to give her a lifeline. But I, I just don't see that happening. I, I don't think it does. I don't think Mitt will cut the Joe Manchin off. I think it would require a conscientious effort of the Republicans to try and establish a standard. Because, like, you know, there's going to be another Republican president, right? And they got Rick Grinnell through despite his tweets, but he was ambassador to Germany. This is a cabinet member. They're never going to get an activist done or anyone who's been um, uh, sort of played the game on social media with abandon. The, the Tandon standard is going to apply to everyone forever. Well, look, if I, if I was, uh, so, you know, Republicans in leadership, I, you know, I might try to see if there was a deal that could be had where you get hand nominated in exchange for, you know, rolling back the minimum wage or, or rolling back some of the, the spending levels and the, the stimulus. But I, I just don't see Democrats going for that. I think they're willing to throw Tandon under the bus, and they're not going to be willing to fight for her if it means giving up some of their other legislative priorities. So I, I just don't think Republicans are going to let Democrats get a get a mulligan <laughs> because especially because it's Manchin who's the one blocking it, not not a Republican. Senator. Yeah, it's it's again. I just it's not a mulligan. I am thinking long term. I am thinking that presidents deserve their cabinet at the beginning, and that if you really do want to have a new standard, otherwise it's just going to jag. We'll be talking about this, you know. Uh, uh, Josh, today's my 65th birthday, and I, I signed on with Salem through the 2028 presidential campaign. God willing, the creek don't rise and my health is good, then I'll quit. And I will watch confirmation battles going forward. And if the Tandon standard is, is adopted, thousands of youngsters are out of the game because uh, they just have played. I mean, they just have, right? Yeah, I mean, you raise a good point that the age of social media is one that's going to make it tough in the future, or there's going to be a new standard in which we're going to have to judge judge nominees by. So I would note that every president, going back to at least Bill Clinton, has had a, a, a nominee that doesn't get it past the Senate. It was Andy, Andy Puzder in the, in the Trump uh, White House. Um, you know, you, the, 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 Zoe, the attorney general wars with Zoe Baird all the way back to Bill Clinton. So there's, there's always been a nominee. John Tower. But yep. John Tower was because he had a drinking problem, and that was a yep. serious deal. And he was wrongfully charged with spousal abuse, but it was a serious allegation. It was just not true. Uh, this is this is tweets. I mean, honestly, th th people have got to think about what they're going to do to their their young friends who are under forty on the hill. Because uh, if I don't know many of them who haven't played the game, Josh, do you? No, I mean, look, I, it, it, it's unfortunate. I mean, look, I, I, people's worst behavior is shown up on Twitter. You, you know, a lot of people. I know a lot of people in Washington that are Twitter warriors, and they're they're, they're perfectly nice and, and 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 cordial people when you know them in person. So, you know, I, I hate to see someone's tweet Twitter tweets, especially after Donald Trump's presidency, be the only standard by which people are judged by. But you know, when you're attacking senators by again, you're attacking. Susan Collins by name, you're, you're using very derogatory language and going after some of the people whose help you need right now. And that's just not a way to, to win friends. And it, would, it would take Ted Lasso-like mercy. It really would. It would require Ted Lasso-like grace. Uh, I'm hoping it comes through. Josh, good to talk to you as always. I want to thank on my birthday, Dwayne. My brother called me yesterday and said, why are you so mean to Dwayne? I said, I'm not mean. He said, well, is there really a a Dwayne Patterson off ramp, and I said, "Absolutely, Dwayne. Is there a Dwayne Patterson off ramp?" Uh, colloquially speaking, yes, I guess. Yeah. There is. So I never lie about Dwayne. I want that to be yeah. out there. Well, Adam Rams, uh, thank you, Adam. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Harley. Especially Dwayne. I may drive past the Dwayne Patterson off ramp today. I'll be back tomorrow, America. Maybe vaccinated, maybe not. We'll find out on the next Hugh Hewitt show.